Good afternoon. My name is Tom Gorman. I'm a partner at Dorsey and Whitney, resident in Washington. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Dorsey and Whitney Federal Enforcement Program. This is the first year that we have uh, inaugurated this program. And we put this together for our clients, friends of the firm, uh, because it's our belief that if you're in business today, whether you're a public company, you're doing business overseas, you're sourcing products overseas, or you're just going across state lines, sooner or later, you're going to encounter a federal regulatory agency. It's, it's very difficult, I think, to do business these days without encountering some sort of federal enforcement agency. And the purpose of our forum is to try to familiarize you with the trends of various agencies, uh, not just to talk about what the law is doing or where the enforcement's going, but what we'd like to do is place you ahead of the curve. We'd like you to understand where these agencies are going so that you can take that into account when you're looking at your business, when you're looking at how you want to do business, when you're looking at your compliance programs. If you know where they're going to be tomorrow, today, you can be ahead of the curve and hopefully not have a problem and improve your business. So today we have three different panels. One is going to focus on the SEC, which is going to be this panel in just a minute. The second is going to focus on the EPA. And the third will focus on FERC enforcement and CFTC enforcement in the area of market manipulation, which is a really sort of new and emerging trend in the area. For those of you who have trading operations, you'll certainly want to stay and, and take a look at that, that particular panel. So that's the purpose of the forum. That's what we're going to do today. We hope you enjoy it. Uh, we hope you find it useful in your business. Um, with that sort of brief introduction, we're going to turn to the first panel, which is focused on the SEC. We have uh, a very distinguished uh, group of folks here to uh, talk to you about these particular issues. Uh, and we're going to focus on something that the SEC hasn't focused on in a long time, that is uh, financial fraud. So, uh, and the new financial fraud task force that they've created and the analytics group that they created to go with it, which some people in the media call RoboCop. Whether or not there is a RoboCop or there ever will be a RoboCop, we'll talk about that and see uh, where that goes. But let me introduce you to the, uh, to the panel members. Um, I have sitting here to, to my right, Don Langerfort. Don is a professor of law at Georgetown University. He specializes in securities regulation. He has written numerous articles uh, which have been cited by the Supreme Court and other courts in the area of securities regulation and at one time was a member of the SEC staff. Sitting to my, le my immediate left is Howard Sheck, who's a partner at KPMG. Howard, uh, prior to joining KPMG, was the <clears throat> chief accountant for the Division of Enforcement. He was there at the idea that, uh, or at the time that they created the uh, RoboCop idea. I don't know if we're going to blame that on Howard, <laughs> but uh, uh, he was there at the, at the infancy of this, so he can help, hopefully give us some insight into this. And s sitting to uh, next to him is Ray Wong, who is a uh, senior executive at Nira Economic Consulting, has studied the idea of using computers and analytics to uh, analyze financial statement fraud for some period of time now. It has a paper out that, that I would commend to you. I put it in the materials. It's, it's, it's very good, and it gives you just some real insight into, into how the SEC may go about this. So with this group, I think, I think what we're going to do is <clears throat> we're going to start back in the days before analytics, back in the days before everything was computer-driven and before they thought about RoboCop. And you go back to, like, 1998. You want to do the next slide, slide please? Uh, <clears throat> if you go back to the next, uh, if you go back to about 1998, uh, the chairman of the SEC at that time gave a speech which today is, is really a famous speech uh, called the numbers game. And the numbers game speech called out financial accounting in three specific areas. Uh, they talked about revenue recognition. They talked about the big bath kind of 
restructuring and, and how that was being done, and they talked about cookie jar reserves. And when Arthur Levitt gave that speech, I think at the New York Economic Club uh, at the time, it was sort of a, a land change or a sea change for everybody in financial accounting, and it kicked off a series of cases for the SEC, which are probably unprecedented. The SEC, for a number of years afterwards, brought financial fraud cases against some of the biggest companies in the country and named a lot of their executives, um, and it ultimately ended with uh, the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley. But since then, financial fraud, which was then probably the most famous thing that the SEC was doing, or at least it was the, the most highly noticed, they seem to have fallen off. And I'm not sure why. I and mean, Howard, maybe you could give us some insight into that. Well, Tom, I think there's a lot of reasons why the numbers have been down at, uh, as far as the accounting cases. I mean, Sarbanes-Oxley, I think, has a lot to do with it, uh, with, uh, you know, after all those big cases that you mentioned, it, you know, Congress put in a lot of new rules related to uh, ICFR reports that the, uh, the issuers have to uh, opine on the effectiveness of their internal controls. The auditors have to uh, opine on that as well. There's 302 certifications creation of this PCOB that has, has you know, regulated the audit, uh, audit firms, clawback issues to, to worry about. So there's, there's a whole host of um, things that I think have caused the amount of restatements and the amount of accounting issues that, that, that companies, um, or in the motives to, to, to create or commit fraud are, are, are lower. So the restatements, I think back in 2007, were at their highest point. They were, there were about 1,800 or so, roughly, restatements. Uh, 2012, I think the number was down to about 600, which is, you know, more than half of that. Um, so I think a lot of it has to do with uh, Sarbanes-Oxley. I mean, there's, there's, there's other reasons, but. Sure, sure but, uh, you know, well, Don, did you have a thought about that? Or? Um, yeah, I, all the evidence is that since Sarbanes-Oxley, there has been noticeable improvement in any number of metrics of financial reporting quality. So things got better. And, and you know, that if that's an explanation for a drop off in enforcement action, uh, so be it. I think we learned once the financial crisis set in that we hadn't solved anything uh, and that internal controls, risk management, uh, those issues are still problematic in many companies. I think the pressure to produce numbers is probably stronger than it was, or at least as strong as it was 10 years ago. Um, so it was a false complacency if anyone thought, okay, Sarbanes-Oxley, job is done, let's move on to something else. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think we're, re we're cycling back now to the realization that you know, fraud is serious, fraud creates immense harm, and the SEC doesn't want to be accused of not paying attention to this, knowing that a year from now or two years from now, there's going to be some giant scandal coming out. Uh, and, and it doesn't want to look like it was asleep. All right. Well, they did a reorganization of the, of the Division of Enforcement uh, three or four years ago. And I thought it was noteworthy that when they created the specialty units, there wasn't one for financial fraud. And a lot of people talked about that at the time, that, that they didn't do one for financial fraud. And I don't know if it was because they thought the problem was solved um, or not. And you know, I, th I think you make a good point, Don. There's, the, the, there's still pressure there. When Arthur Levitt gave that speech, the bottom line to all of that was you had, to make, you had to make the earnings. You had to make the EPS. You had to make the street. Otherwise, your stock dropped and whoop, you got sued in the class action. And it's worse today. It's with the 24-hour news cycle, with, with blogs, with all kinds of people publishing all sorts of things about what's going on and tracking these companies. If you, even sometimes when you make the numbers, if the street's not happy, your stock still drops and you still get sued. So if anything, it's worse, and it ought to be um, there ought to be more pressure on these people, which ought to mean that there's something else going on. But the number of restatements has dropped, as Howard said, which was always the sort of hallmark. That's how the SEC kicked off a lot of their cases, I think, in the old days, right? Right, and I, I think there's some more dynamics that, that are worth talking about, is that I think during the credit crisis, the issues really were not the tradition. They weren't the earnings management issues or the rev issues, um, even the big bath charges. 
issues, or they could they, they that was actually a risk during the during the credit crisis. But if you actually look at the number of big bath cases that are out there historically, there are, there aren't that many on that particular issue. But during the credit crisis, the issues really related to uh, valuation of securities and loan loss reserves, of highly judgmental areas, which were different and are harder harder cases to prove, harder cases to bring, at least on a fraud basis. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're really getting into the internal controls and disclosure issues. A lot of the cases brought were related to disclosures of subprime uh, exposure and MD&A issues related to things related to the credit crisis. So I think I think you have to take that in consideration in order to sort of look at the, the numbers. Um, I think the reason why they didn't this, they didn't form a uh, financial uh, fraud task force, at least the stated reason was that because 25 percent of the cases historically had been financial fraud cases, that the, the task force or the unit, if you will, the specialized unit, would, have, would be too big. So the, the assumption was, well, they're gonna, those cases are going to happen anyway. We don't need a unit for it. And, and I'll say this, that decision was made before I got there. So I guess if it was my decision, I probably would have created a, mm -hmm. a specialized unit. But there was some good justification for why that they thought that wasn't necessary. And um, But I think it's, it's less now a, a refocus um, back to financial fraud versus a, a realization that the um, you just can't rely on traditional reactive measures in order to find the cases. You can't just rely on restatements. You can't just rely on... Uh, whistleblowers or self-reporting, you really have to go out and look for them. That's that's what I tried to do for the three and a half years I was there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're right. It, following Levitt's speech, those cases were all situations where there had already been a massive fraud, and the SEC showed up later, Right. and then they picked through it, and then they brought the case, which is traditional SEC enforcement. It's, it's hard to be there at the infancy, I mean, it's one of the reasons um, when Stanley Sporkin was director, he tried to make the accountants the advance guard. And in a, in a relatively famous Ninth Circuit case, they said, nice try, Stan. No, that's not what the statute says. So you can't do that. And, you know, that didn't stop him from trying because the accountants are in there first and they always wanted to get an edge, but they were always behind. So is the new task force, is there a way to take data, Gray, and uh, maybe get, a, get an edge and get out in front, get the edge? The in, insider traders always want an edge. They always want to be out in front. Can the SEC get themselves an edge in financial front? I, I think there's uh, several things to bring up here. You, you have a situation where uh, essentially it's a cops and robbers game. You know, you can have... Uh, uh, you know, more scrutiny on a company's financial statements. And, you know, back in the day before people looked at these things, before, uh, uh, you know, terminology like a uh, big bath or, um, you know, you have uh, a cookie jar reserves, you know, before terminology like this became common, uh, you know, companies uh, were free to do that without uh, as much scrutiny. So when, when, when things are looked at, they, they stop doing it. it it's, uh, you know, a, a joke I often tell is, uh, you know, what? how do people launder money back in the day before the government wanted to know where mo your money came from? You went to the ba bank with a big bag of money over your bank, <laughs> and you, you made, made a big deposit because no one was looking at it. And I think, um, you know, as... Uh, you know, as we point out, uh, with Sarbanes-Oxley, it could very well have a nice deterrent effect. But but you, you've essentially created a, a world where things become a bit more complex and harder to find. And, um, uh, you know, you have a, a situation where the SEC needs to develop you know, better um, and more advanced techniques for, for uncovering these sorts of things. And, and uh, you know, another thing I wanted to mention is uh, during the financial crisis, you know, you have... Uh, um, you know the the uh, 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 you know focus a few you know like a decade ago on uh, essentially things like the you know big bath and like cookie jar reserves. Now that that's a different kind of animal. You have companies who are actively trying to portray um, a situation where their company is going to do better in the future when when that's not true. And uh, during the financial crisis, uh, uh, there's a there was a you know stranger thing that happened essentially where um, there were these assets where. Uh, it's almost a binary world. They're, they're, they're worth what they're worth on the books, or they aren't worth anything. <laughs> and and that, it's, it's a different type of situation that, that uh, is going on over there, because if everything is okay, if there, if there is no uh, um, you know, market crash, if there is no uh, um, um, you know, triggering of that systemic risk that brings down uh, the, the economy the way it did, then you know, the fact is that uh, those assets were worth what they were worth. So, so you, have, you have more subtle things going on over here. And uh, what, what the, I think what the SEC is trying to do, and uh, you know, Howard will have a lot more to say about this, 
you know, with data analytics, it's uh, a methodology of essentially trying to get ahead of the curve to, you know, before you even see smoke or, or you know, hopefully before there's a fire, um, you look at the um, uh, a certain risk characteristics, you know, certain companies that are in a situation and have done their accounting a certain way and that uh, are under an, an especially great amount of pressure to perform. And I think you, if you can get out ahead of that, that, that allows uh, the, you know, everybody to, to, to sleep a little bit easier. Well, Howard, is that, is that, you were there, I think, when they were trying to figure out this task force. So is that, it, is that the idea? They're going to try to get out ahead of this? This is sort of a revisiting of the notion of using the accountants uh, to get ahead of it? Or? Well, let me, let me back up and put it in context, because the, the fraud and audit task force is separate animal from the AQM model or the accounting quality model that's being developed by the Division of Economic Risk and Analysis, Risk and Analysis. Um, the hope would be that the Financial Fraud Task Force would use and utilize AQM and uh, work interactively with DIRA, but they are, uh, the AQM model and the data analytics aren't being developed necessarily within the enforcement division, it's within the, with the, other, the other division. I worked at the beginning with Craig Lewis and his team on trying to evaluate the output and of the model and trying to refine the model. So I should probably explain a little bit what the model is. I mean, sure. um, essentially what it is is it's trying to uh, identify uh, discretionary accruals that companies might book in order to manage earnings. And that could include building up the reserve or releasing a reserve. So it's, it's looking for, it's essentially looking for earnings management. That's what it was designed to do. So one important thing to note is that it, it wasn't designed to look for uh, revenue recognition fraud or expense recognition or other types of fraud really was focused solely on earnings management. And what it, what it did was had a, a series of fraud risk indicators, fraud risk inducers, and layered on financial, traditional financial ratios to build a, a profile of a company to see whether it was an outlier in its own industry or whether certain metrics looked funny. But again, it was geared toward earnings management. Uh, the fraud risk uh, indicators uh, uh, were, are things like traditional fraud risk factors that accountant looks at, accountants look at, like whether um, accountants have resigned or whether management has resigned. They, they talked about uh, prevalence of off-balance sheet entities as one of the factors. And the inducers are things like motives. Are, are they, uh, uh, is the company having losses? Uh, are they losing market share? Things like that. So that, that's what the model is trying to do. Now, the, the, one of the problems is it, then by, by the very nature of it, it generates a lot of false positives. So when I was there, we were trying to figure out how to refine it, how to, how to make it useful to the people in enforcement. Um, my understanding is uh, currently uh, it, it's sort of in limbo right now. I don't think they're really using it in the way that they had hoped and, and the way it had been um, talked about at least a year ago. Um, so I think it remains to be seen um, how soon we'll really see results in, in investigations that are really coming out of that particular uh, program. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they are using data analytics. I mean, we, it, um, we've, we've seen this in some of the other areas that SEC enforcement is working on, so it would seem that they could probably translate some of that maybe into, the, into this area. Sure. I, there's a, at least a 20-year history in insider trading of using the blue sheets, using trading data, running it through fairly sophisticated software um, to look for correlations, to look for connections, and identify traders who, who might go on the suspicious list. That, that's, that's been around for a long time, and it's a success. Uh, it, it certainly has uh, moved the insider trading enforcement program forward. Um, what we're discovering, though, is it's one thing to identify suspicious trades it's another thing to predict that next year this company will be revealed to have committed fraud. Um, one of the problems, and it's part of the false positives problem, is we have so much data we could possibly look at and so many correlations we could possibly make that the computer could be spewing out long, long lists of Let's worry about this company. Let's worry about this company. You know, something in its accrual, something in its 
uh, in its reports is outside of parameters. Um, and in a world of limited resources, where you don't have the people, you can just say, oh, suspicious company, you know, spend a week, two weeks looking into that. You, you don't know what to do with all of this information. Yes, lots of false positives, but a gigantic data dump uh, on top of that. Um, so, you know, it, it's easy to get caught up in the idea, well, it worked in insider trading. Uh, thus, let's move it into these other areas. Uh, having said that, you know, we, we've all been through over the last decade options backdating, uh, market timing, all of which were the product of data analytics outside the SEC. Uh, they were academic research that identified that you know, the chances of luck driving the option exercise date for so many companies over so many observations is infinitesimal. Um, market timing, I, I, again, you, you find with a large amount of data, basis for, so I think it's going to be the case that going forward, people in the private sector at hedge funds, people in the academic sector are going to be improving these models and the SEC can't afford to not be paying attention. There's a, a, a journal article that says, looking back at Bernie Madoff, just to get out of financial fraud for a second, that based on a relatively small set of factors, you can predict investment advisor risk such that if you invested in a portfolio that just eliminated the top 5% in risk, you would make an incredible sum of money compared to if you were still in those uh, in the advisory relationships. You know, if that's right, and that's you know, if that's right, the next time an investment advisor Ponzi scheme scandal comes about, and somebody points to that study and says, "SEC, weren't you told three years ago that you know how to look for this kind of fraud?" If the SEC says oh, that wasn't on our agenda, uh, the SEC is going to look real bad, and the New York State Attorney General will probably help it make look bad, make it look bad. If, if history serves, the New York Attorney General will have to study, and he'll find he'll find the place first, and then the SEC will be up testifying on the Hill, trying to explain why they didn't read that mm -hmm. paper too. But you know, th but that points back to where we were. If you can do that, if you can take an investment advisor and, or a sampling of investment advisors and say, you look at these factors, these guys are at risk. You should be stepping up your inspection program. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, they do some of this in, in a simpler format. Insider trading, I agree, is that's that's they've done it the best there. I mean, they've done, they've done an incredible job, in my view, with insider trading. They're, they're way out in front of a lot of this stuff. Uh, more than more so, I think, than a lot of the, a lot of times the public knows. But in simpler ways, they do it: forms threes, form fours, things like that. They're now running a program on SARS. Um, I believe they're running a program on short selling and Rule 105. So if they can do that, and then they have studies like you're talking about, they ought to be able to figure out how to sort this data dump and and, and get to some places. That I, I think there's uh, there's an important thing to point out over here the um, uh, the, the way that a lot of these cross sectional studies work you know where um, I, I think uh, Don mentioned earlier uh, the, this these option options backdating cases it's it's easier for these types of methodologies to uh, identify thousands of companies and to say that uh, these ones look funny. <laughs> and and it, it's, it's a very important distinction, though, between here's thousands of companies and here's the 200 that look funny, and, and being able to identify which of those 200 actually did something wrong. It, 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 it's uh, maybe, maybe some of them just what? happened to, right, to, 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 to look like they did something wrong, but did not actually do that. So I think, um, and, and, and I find it interesting because, uh, uh, you know, Don, what you said earlier about um, hedge funds trying to get into this game, it's easier to make a profit off of a large cross-sectional study and to be able to filter out uh, a certain uh, portion of, of a, you know, a large number of companies you examine and, and make a, a large-scale bet on that than it is for someone like the SEC to come in and say, well, I've identified um, out of, you know, 9,000 companies, these 300 look like something might be wrong. Now, all else held equal, in, in, uh, you know, in the past, they would have had to look at 9,000 companies. 
Now they only have to look at, you know, whatever it is, uh, 300, 500, but 300 or 500 might still be too many. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it might only be uh, five out of those 300. So, so if you look at it purely from, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, more like a, um, an economist's perspective, you've improved the hit rate, but the hit rate's not improved enough to, to, to actually turn this into something yet that, that uh, 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 you know, aids the enforcement process enough. Uh, the, the second thing I, I would add is that, you know, we have a lot of these other yeah, Nero, we deal with this all the time. Um, there are specific Nero questions you ask. And, um, uh, you know, for example, with Forms 3, 4, and 5 and with insider trading, that there's a limited universe of data. Um, you know, what are the transactions maybe in one stock in a uh, series of stocks um, uh, by certain individuals? And there's a profitability of those trades. There's uh, the performance of the companies. There, there's few enough variables that you can define um, uh, uh, you know, a methodology of, of being able to, you know, get down from the 300, maybe down to 50 <laughs> that you need to look at. So, so I think it really what's interesting about it is that maybe we're not there yet, but, you know, these methodologies work. The, the question is how to combine it with a human element where, you know, and I find it funny too because, uh, you know, RoboCop, if you actually saw the movie, <laughs> The entire point of the movie was uh, that you cannot rely on a computer <laughs> and that you wanted, uh, um, you know, essentially interaction between a human element and, and the computing element so that you, you uh, uh, filter out the false positives. So, so I think it's really a waiting game. You know, we need to see when, when it's going to get there. You know, what I would add is um, two different things. One is text analytics because one of the other things that uh, Dira is working on is, is text analytics. And the other human component, I would say, would be the the judgment of not only the enforcement folks that are analyzing these companies and looking at what to investigate, but the Division of Corporation Finance is, is reviewing all the filings. They're making comments. They're interacting with the issuer. So is the Office of Chief Accountant. So, you know, there's a lot of in interaction on the financial uh, accounting issues and disclosure issues by people that should be able to recognize some of the risk factors if there, if there is a fraud going on. And... You know, when you combine that with potential text analysts, well, which I'll talk about a little bit in a second, and potential uh, RoboCop type things, I mean, you start to be able to narrow the universe a little farther. But I think uh, we're not quite there yet, because if it was that easy to do, you know, Wall Street would be, you know, figuring out how to how to how to identify those fraudulent companies, and the short sellers would always be yeah, correct, and right. you know, every you know, it would be it would be easy. But let, let me tell you about text analytics for a second. Is that the other thing they're trying to develop is um, a ways to spot deception in the filings themselves, and it could be press releases too. It doesn't have to just be SEC filings. But they, the way they're developing the the model, uh, to my understanding, would be that. They look at um, the AAERs, which are the accounting and auditing enforcement releases, the, the prior uh, enforcement actions. So that's the universe of fraudulent companies that are out there. And they would index all the 10Ks, for example, for all those companies to say this is the model or, uh, of, of what a fraudulent company has said in the past. Um, and then they somehow have a way to, to index all, those, those, uh, all that text and um, and then they can run it against actual text of a of a current filing, and it identifies certain subject matter areas and breaks it all the words down and figures out whether there's under inclusive or over inclusive disclosure in certain areas. Um, I would think under inclusive would probably be more uh, applicable to, to potential fraud rather than over. But you, you never know. You might be be talking about a a bunch of stuff just to kind of deflect from an, another. Right, and Craig Lewis, who up yeah. until recently ran the division, yeah. is one of the pioneers in textual analysis in MDNAs. That right. MDNA is the most sensitive portion yeah. of uh, of the narrative part of disclosure. Um, and what he discovered in his academic research, and he certainly pushed this at the commission, was that when you look at those companies that were later subject to some form of accounting for fraud or AAR. Um, the before they started the scheme and after involves very normal patterns of discourse. While they're committing it, their words, their sentences change. Uh, and you got it exactly right. His main point is companies start changing the subject. It's a deflection point. They start writing the MDNA so you're thinking about everything except where they're playing the games. 
But that's noticeable uh, and robust enough that it would tell you. So you know, I, I think something both of you said before is really important. If I were talking about the promise of something like this at the commission, I'd be less likely to say, this is going to ring a bell and say, there's the company, they're committing fraud. Rather, this is going to be a really eye-opening form of education for the people in Court Fin, for the people in OC, uh, who are there on the ground and wouldn't necessarily think that if you've got a lot of executives who are not exercising in the money stock options, this is another big area, uh, which is a measure of overconfidence, that that rings some bells, that companies like that are actually more likely to get into AE, AAER trouble um, than ones where the executives are doing the normal thing, which is diversifying uh, through a program of sales. So I, I, I think this can really help enforcement people, court fin people, OC people, um, 40 Act people, um, by helping them realize there, there are a surprising number of things that correlate with getting into trouble later on. But you're talking about looking at the text and focusing on the absence of certain factors, or maybe the absence of the way they talked before, so you would see a change mm -hmm. in the text, which would help you sort then the problem that you had before. I mean, in, in insider trading, to go back to what you were talking about earlier, they have this, they have the same problem because FINRA has, has, has a computer, it monitors the market, it, it generates these reports if you go outside this parameter, that parameter, the other parameter, and they send this stuff to the SEC and say, this looks suspicious. It's not necessarily insider trading. But then there's so many of those, at least that's my understanding, there's still so many of those that you have to find <laughs> other factors to sort them down, which is the same thing we're looking at here. But instead of what, what you're talking about is instead of focusing on um, the numbers, which I think is, is the more traditional yes. approach back in Levitt's day when they brought those cases where they looked at the numbers, they looked at the uh, change in accounting principles, you changed the auditors, you did that sort of stuff. Now it's you change the way you talk. Mm -hmm. And if they can refine that down, they can couple RoboCop with a couple of enforcement lawyers and maybe find something. Mm -hmm. Maybe if they if they can sort that down. Right. So is that, 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 is that that's the feature. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's that's the kind of analytics you think that they can develop, right? Uh, I I find it interesting that, that this is a possible example of where uh, there there are some things that human beings are always going to be better at, and that that uh, you know includes looking through a pile of financial statements and uh, essentially doing the detective work to try to find motivations for doing certain things. Uh, and, and this goes beyond uh, you know, simply determining whether or not uh, you know, a company's accruals changed in a way that, that you know, uh, pegs them as an outlier. You know, the, the outlier um, uh, identification is only one piece among many. Now, now you know, a human being can go in there and say, no, 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 I, I've seen this before. <laughs> uh, you know, they're, they're clearly doing A, B, and C. Uh, what interests me about this uh, text analytics uh, issue is it may very well be that human beings are worse at um, uh, identifying what people are not saying. <laughs> it, so so you, it's entirely possible that you can have a computer go in and uh, essentially uh, notice that uh, there was this chatter that, you know, we, we don't read anything about it. There was an offhand comment about, um, you know, a set of accounts or an accounting treatment. And, and we, you know, let's face it, sometimes we find that boring. <laughs> so, so we don't notice it. And uh, there, you know, is radio silence afterwards. The computer could could very well pick this stuff up. So, so I, I see it as a combination. And, and then another thing you mentioned earlier, Don, I, I think um, part of this, part of what's going to eventually work, needs to be uh, things that combine data from a wide variety of sources. It it it, it could be you have uh, text analytics telling you something, the financials are telling you something else, uh, and trading patterns by insiders, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, come into the equation as well. Right. And to go back to the Madoff story, certainly one of the things the Commission had to attend to was data coordination um, within the SEC. Um, that often it, it was a source of breakdown. OC might be seeing something, um, people in Corp Fin might be seeing something, enforcement may do a preliminary investigation into something, and nobody talks. Um, they, people don't talk and put two and two and two together. I, I think the Commission has made a lot of progress on centralizing information 
so that it becomes easier when you think something is suspicious to find out if anybody else at the commission or at FINRA uh, or, or in the states have also uh, tracked something. And that, that's, a, that's an important step forward. Oh, sure. That, I, that was the whole Madoff problem. Yes. The information came into different offices to different attorneys right. at different points in time, and nobody ever got together and said, wow, what, what are we looking at here? Right. Everybody had a little piece. Bernie Madoff was... You know, well known on, on Wall Street. Um, everybody knew who he was. He was well known for developing computers and trading, things like that. And um, <clears throat> so nobody thought twice about it. Whereas, had right. everybody talked about it, had you given me your piece mm -hmm. and Howard gave me his piece, I might have said, wow, look at that. But nobody. And, and then what Ray is saying, I think, is really important put that together with a data feed of these other things so that you're. Combining the human intelligence that is centralized and accessible mm -hmm. with the data analytics, then you, you do empower somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, if they want to spend the time, and, and we always come back to resources, but uh, if you want to spend the time, you're in a very rich environment uh, for deciding whether this is a case worth opening an investigation. So let's take a public service pause here for just one second. For those of you who uh, would like New York CLE, uh, I'm going to read a number. I get to read it twice. That's the rules. And uh, you have to write it down. So please uh, try to try to write it down if you like New York CLE credit. It is Z as in zebra, K as in kindergarten, T as in Tom, five, one, four. Uh, one more time. Z like zebra, K like kite, T like Tom, five, one, four, write that down. You get credit for CLE in New York. You don't write it down. You don't get any credit. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, the, it's the way the rules work. So, um, um, Tom, I was going to add that um, the Fraud and Audit Task Force arguably is supposed to try to bridge that gap. I think that's one of the, the main purposes for creating uh, that unit. Um, my personal view is that while it's appropriate and necessary for the SEC to, to develop data analytics to try to ferret out fraud, I, my, I still think that predominant sources of the cases are going to remain to be reactive sources, which are going to be restatements and mining the restatements that they have, the whistleblower tips that they get, and um, self-reporting. I think it's just by the very nature of the <laughs> fact that um, you know, comp the SEC is not embedded in these companies. They don't do examinations of these companies in the way that, say, OC would go out and do an examination. Um, if the auditors are out there and they're auditing a company and they're being lied to and they're being deceived, um, then it is inherently very difficult for an investor to glean that from just reading the 10K. Now, there, there are certain risk factors, clearly, that if the, if the Revenue is, uh, you know, up here and the cash flow is down here. It's like it's obviously a fraud risk factor. You know, why is that? There could be legitimate reasons for that. But that's where you look at the judgment of people that have experience right. looking at those fraud risk factors and doing the old-fashioned investigation as well. So I don't think the, the holy grail is data analytics for, for fraud, uh, financial fraud. I think it's important that they develop it. I think it would be useful if they can make it work. But I'm, I'm not sure. I think we're a couple of years or more away from that, in my, in my, in my view. Yeah, I, well, yeah. I think in the marketplace, a lot of times, <clears throat> I, I remember when they put the announcement out about a year ago, and that's all anybody was talking about, was they're going to have a computer program, bingo, they're going to find out who's committing financial fraud, they are, they're all going to get investigated, then they're all going to get sued, which clearly is not right. the model I think that everybody's talking about. This is a much more nuanced and much more complicated model, and, um, you know, as, as you said, Don, it took them a long time to develop the insider trading model, right. which, which works just incredibly well now. But th that was years. In the beginning, it was hand, hand sorting through blue sheets saying, what have I got here? And the problem was always, I've got too much data to figure this out. Mm -hmm. uh, that was always the problem, because you, you, had, you had to figure out, okay, yeah. how am I going to cut this stuff? Let's look at people in Pittsburgh. Let's look at people who traded over a thousand shares, whatever. You had to, had to have some sort of parameters to figure out what you could do. Now, they have this all down, and I think, you know, it, it sounds like if they take text and then they take some of these other indicators, eventually they'll be able to create a program that, 
probably won't get the. I, I can't imagine they're going to get ahead of the curve. So no. I'm going to say, these guys are committing fraud. You know, they just started. Let's go get them before they cook the books. But they might get there sooner than before the company tanks, which which would be an improvement. And, and I think there's a middle ground that uh, maybe the most likely future is. You know, as you're identifying perhaps a large number of these companies and don't have the resources to turn this into an investigation, you can turn it into a letter or a sweep if there are lots of letters, um, such that you know, a company is asked to explain why it is the text changed. And that's going to have an effect. I mean, if, if I get a letter telling me, all of a sudden, the language in your MDNA has changed. Could you ex please explain that? Uh, I don't think I'm going to keep playing the games I'm playing uh, at that point. Um, the false positives problem is lots of companies are going to get letters forcing them to explain themselves when there is nothing to explain. Uh, and you know, the unintended consequences of, identify, uh, of the world of false positives. Um, may cause companies that are engaged in perfectly legitimate uh, behavior to back off of that for fear it's ringing some bell somewhere uh, on some computer at the SEC. So I, I, I think um, the world of sweeps and the world of informal requests uh, is probably going to be the first place we find responsiveness to, 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 to the data that's being kicked out. Well, and the, and the sweeps really ought to, you're right, they can, they can have a negative effect because no company wants to get a letter saying, explain this to me, because they call, they call all the outside lawyers, and the outside lawyers go, oh, this is bad. Yeah. And, you know, then everybody starts running around looking at stuff, and they start changing stuff that maybe they shouldn't change. On the other hand, the good part of that is that, one, the SEC ought to learn something, you know, after a while, if you do a sweep of, um, uh, like I'm, I mentioned earlier, they're doing one now that I think people are just starting to see on SARS, so which is pretty simple. But if they do that, the, you know, why didn't you file one for the last five years, brokerage firm? Uh, what's up with you? Everybody else is filing every three years. Well, they'll learn something, and then they'll modify that program, and then they'll move it on. And the same thing with financial fraud, if they're looking at the text and saying, how you change that, you know, why'd you do that? Eventually, they'll figure out, you know, what people are doing with that, and, and they'll get that refined down so that it starts to work, and maybe you have better parameters for <clears throat> for doing some of this stuff, but they'll change everybody's right. conduct in the meantime. Uh, and one of the downside risks uh, that economists regularly point out when when you're looking at studies like this is the data that you use to construct these models um, relates to a prior period. Um, so what you've discovered is that from 2002 to 2010, these were predictors. But if the world has changed, and from 2002 to 2010 has changed in many ways, what you were observing during that time period may not be a good predictor of fraud 2016. Um, we know that fraud is sensitive to business cycles. Um, fraud moves from industry to industry as competitive conditions and others create motivations. Um, so th you need dynamic models. Uh, any hedge fund will tell you your model had better learn on a Bayesian basis as fast as technologically possible. Uh, whether the SEC will be able to have that same capacity given how expensive that technology is to keep up and how how learning models really work, th that's another risk, that the SEC will be very good at telling you why there was fraud five years ago. I'm actually surprised there hasn't been more risk-based <clears throat> investigations or sweeps, however you want to describe them. I think the new director has called, said street sweeps is what they're going to call it for the fraud, not a task force. but. You know, I know they're looking at revision restatements because that's something that we started looking at when I was there, so it, they kind of brought it into the task force. But there hasn't really been, to my knowledge, you know, any um, or as many, I should say, uh, sweeps in particular accounting areas that, as I would have, have expected, in, you know, given that the task force was formed over a year ago.
Um, it may come down to resources yeah. that Don mentioned before, because at the end of the day, they have six uh, six accountants, six lawyers, and two two heads. So they have about 14 people in the, in, in the task force altogether. It's not an investigation unit, so they're not really um, supposed to at least take the take the case from soup to nuts. They're really uh, doing sort of a pre-investigation or a kicking of the tires or um, I, 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 I use the term incubate uh, before I left to try to incubate uh, a set of facts to try to figure out whether there is actually something worth investigating. And, but that takes a lot of actually, yeah. that takes a lot of time and um, you can't do 200 of them. You can't do maybe even 100 of them. Uh, with with twelve people, so right, and, and I think also there's this uh, um, to, to, to piggyback off of what Don said earlier. I think that there's a real danger of um, establishing a certain methodology, which companies will then react Learn. to. Yeah. It, it's 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 sort of like uh, um, you know back in the day, uh, SPVs were all the rage, and when you start scrutinizing S SPVs, uh, companies stop using them. <laughs> they're, they're, they're going to use something else. So, so I, I think, and, and there's an interesting uh, uh, concept here about a, a deterrent effect. If you know that uh, the SEC is going to be examining even just loosely speaking statistical anomalies, um, they could keep you on your toes. Um, you know, some people might say, well, what good does that do? I, I think, you know, uh, um, you're keeping uh, potential you know, criminals on, on their toes is always good. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, it maybe it makes it harder and it makes it more um, costly for you know someone who want or a company that wants to commit financial fraud to do so. Um, well, if it costs more, you're, you're going to reduce the the amount of uh, fraud that occurs. Um, to to uh, go further as an economist, uh, but, but uh, this is the last thing before I put you to sleep. <laughs> the, 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 the overall policy question is whether or not uh, the you know instituting these uh, these sorts of sweeps is going to impede economic activity in the way that uh, overwhelms the, the the effect of a lower amount of fraud. Sure. Well, you, you certainly don't want to do that, but I think if you've got if you can refine the models down enough so that you've got at least something that is the equivalent of insider trading suspicious activity. You know, you bought naked options, you know, five minutes before they announced the tender offer. You know, stuff like that, which is, you know, that's, that's probably worth looking at that kind of an insider trading case because something may have happened there. Maybe not. Some people just do that, but maybe so. That's, so if they can get it down to that, there may be a benefit to doing this text analysis. Mm -hmm. It may well cause people to look at the way they're doing their disclosure. If they're, they're, they've got really re robust disclosure here, and then they come over here and it's like, well, that's not so good. <laughs> right. And then you come over here and it's still wandering around. You know, you might say to yourself, well, why is that? We'd like to have robust disclosure all the time because that's that's what that's what the SEC wants, and that's that should be good for your shareholders. It should be good for the marketplace as opposed to sort of wandering around. So, if maybe you don't find it, but um, it's just starting, and so that's why you're seeing this. And I, I, I think yeah. there's a bunch of academic studies on this, aren't there, Don? About it, it's, it sort of creeps up on you. You don't just one day get up and just cook the books into this wild right. Place. Yeah, in fact, I was mentioning before a, a study that was done at Wharton and the mm -hmm. University of Chicago um, that looked at AAER, so that, that was the ultimate. Um, what distinguished companies that ended up in that world from the companies that are not the subject of enforcement action? And, and it looked at two factors. One is evidence that the particular executives at this company have strong beliefs about the company's future, overconfidence using exercise of stock options as a proxy for that. And then looking at the pattern and finding that you can find the abnormal accruals beginning at a probably submaterial level early on, which is a signal that that's the overconfidence at work. You, you don't do submaterial game plan, but to the extent you're making judgments that reflect you think there aren't going to be big losses, that's going to affect um, the financials. But of course, once you're overconfident and you're wrong, the tendency we know is to double down. And so the, the, uh, they show graphically uh, the growth of financial reporting fraud at a company from this early submaterial uh, step by step until 
you have to be much more aggressive to hide what now is a big problem if anybody catches it. Uh, so yeah, very nice um, set of lessons there uh, about things to look for and, and what might be indicators of uh, of fraud. And I can attest to that. We, we, we've, had, we've done a lot of uh, casework at, at NERA where um, we, we, it, it's interesting because we almost have to go backwards. We, we find that there is a large fraud at the end. Right. <laughs> and and uh, what, what one of the um, nuances to, to these analyses is that it starts out small. You, you, you look back one quarter, you look back two quarters, and you find out that uh, we, we don't know how it started exactly, but it appears that uh, you know, if you have to hide uh, uh, a certain shortfall in earnings, uh, um, you know, in the first quarter, um, if it gets worse and worse, you just necessarily just carrying over the old, um, you know, the old fraud, so to speak. You're now you're now stacking it higher and higher, and it becomes harder and harder to tell the truth. So, so I, I think I think I, I do agree. You know, if, if you if you have uh, an effect where there's a deterrence. <laughs> And, and in fact, uh, I, I think there's another feedback uh, uh, situation or, or a feedback effect that I neglected to mention earlier. That that is, if you get companies to get used to better and more disclosure, it will become cheaper over time. So so that that uh, the economist in me you know takes some comfort in that. Yeah, and, and I want to add just on, on top of that. You know, we're looking today in this program for takeaways that you know, people running compliance programs. Uh, my work is on the intersection between executive psychology and financial fraud. And one of the nice uses of some of this data analytics is to teach you that fraud is rarely rational. It can be. It can certainly be opportunistic. But in situations like overconfidence, um, the indicators you'd be looking for early on are the the true believers, the ones who have drunk the Kool-Aid. Um, that's you know not on the typical compliance programs list. Look to see who's been drinking too much Kool-Aid lately. Uh, but it does actually track onto um, onto lessons you can learn if you want to be a good compliance uh, person in a company, uh, want to be running. Um, a, a program that tries to keep everybody on track. Although behavioral characteristics are things that auditors look at when they're yeah. doing their the fraud, fraud, triangle. fraud yeah. triangle risk assessments as well. So maybe getting that more into the C-suite and the yes. internal audit mindset is is useful as well. So I think that's what you're yeah what you're right. I, I think for yeah. audit committees, they're they're actually uh, you know there's a lot a lot of education that I, we talked about the education of enforcement people, mm -hmm. OC people, uh, but I think some of these messages about the tells, the indicators that the company is getting step by step into trouble, uh, ought most aggressively be delivered to chairs of audit committees uh, and, and the various other people that, since Sarbanes Oxley, uh, we've decided play a frontline role uh, in, in dealing with these issues. Well, and you're, you're talking about situations, though, that <clears throat> would start off maybe, maybe immaterial. You know, you're just pushing the edge. You're you know, pushing you the drink, edge. <clears throat> you drink, you drink the Kool-Aid. The accounting principles say that you really ought to be doing, say, the accruals this way, and you look at them and you say, yeah, they really ought to be that way, but we're not going to quite make, you know, so we could just push it mm -hmm. a shade. You know, I'm not committing fraud. I'm just pushing the edge here. It's a judgment call. Yeah. And then the next time, of course, it's and it's the, the, the line has moved. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the line moved. And you start making them up at the end. Yeah. The numbers up at the end. And, and I, I, it's, it's almost the, the, the I, I think some of the mentality is that I, the, the game's crooked anyway. Uh, the Wall Street punishes yeah. me right. because I missed one cent uh, on my earnings. That they thought it was three dollars. I have two ninety nine. And, and that's and the rationalization. That's the rationalization. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's right. That's the rationalization. Yeah. But that's the same rationalization that the guy with the legitimate investment fund that, you know, he trades and he trades, and all of a sudden he's got losses, and he says, well, I can make those up. I won't tell him about it because next quarter I got a new model and I'm going to win. And he's the guy who drank the Kool-Aid. He believes the model's going to work. He's going to get those results from zero or minus zero probably mm -hmm. up to something. And so he doesn't tell everybody the truth. And think, what do you got? Arguably, the whistleblower payouts that are coming out now could <clears throat> prevent some of these frauds, or at least identify them. Because if you have, uh, you know, Health South as an example, where uh, Scrushy was, you know, controlling everybody at, at the company, you know, you would think nowadays that someone 
would want to rat rat some yeah. rat them out rather than continue to drink the Kool Aid, given the the amount of payouts that they could get. But but it's surprising that you, you know when I was there, I think the numbers are about three thousand tips that. Uh, that the uh, division gets a year, and about 20% roughly are, are for accounting fraud, and some of those are, are accounting related, and, and some of those are pretty good tips, and some of them are not. Uh, but I, I would think that there'd be more quality whistleblower tips that are generating the big, huge cases if the big frauds were actually out there. But mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll see. So, so really, when you look at this accounting task force or <clears throat> accounting and auditing task force, whatever they're calling it, it's not really what people, I don't think it's really what people thought it was when they announced it. It really sounded relatively simplistic when they announced it, but you're saying that this is a much more sophisticated operation with the computers being one little piece because they're only focused on one little piece of this. Well, the, the idea of the, te of the financial fraud, um, fraud and audit task force is, I want to use the correct <laughs> name, uh, is really to try to get more proactive uh, and try to get, have a dedicated group of people to be more proactive. So they're going to be looking at dealing with academic research and talking to academics. They're going to be monitoring certain high-risk companies, trying to look at industry trends. Um, they identify things like looking at class action lawsuits, which I don't. We looked at when I was there, and historically have looked at. I, I don't view that as proactive. I view that as more reactive. Um, but I, I think it, it really is just a mechanism for the division to identify potential areas of risk that should be investigated, and then be able to farm that off to the investigators, the attorneys, and accountants that are actually going to do the investigation. And that's really how it's designed. So there needs to be a lot of coordination between the Fraud and Audit Task Force and the rest of the division, including um, coordination with the Office of Chief Accountant within enforcement, the Mike Maloney, who has my <coughs> old job, and there's you know uh, roughly 40, 40 accountants in, in D.C. and about 60 more across the country. I mean, they're on the front lines for identifying and proactively identifying accounting fraud, too, so it's not all delegated yeah. just to this task force. The whole, arguably the whole division is supposed to be doing it, this is just one, that's just one piece of it. So the task force really becomes sort of a communication point maybe in some ways because you've got OC, you've got Corp Finn, you've got the chief accountant's office, you've got all of these sources looking at that, and you've got the office of the whistleblower, which presumably is getting some information. If you Like a clearinghouse. It's like, it's like, a, it's like yeah. a clearinghouse yeah. to try to pull yeah. all this stuff together so that they can, um, I don't, I don't know if, get back in the game is quite the right thing, but they haven't really focused on these cases, I don't think, um, since the financial crisis. So this would this would help them do that. But uh, so I would disagree with that. But no? You think they are focusing on it? Well, um, I think it's true that they didn't form a, 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 a unit, which I think did have some collateral consequences. But I think the, the people, you know, the, myself and my job and the 100 accountants across the division were certainly focused on accounting fraud when we were there. Uh, the attorneys that specialize and focus on those kinds of cases. We're certainly actively looking for those kinds of cases and, and doing those cases. I think the issue really relates to the quality of actual cases that are out there. Um, certainly there's a piece that the SEC might be missing, and that's really why the, the Fraud and Audit Task Force is or, or was formed, because, you know, is there something that the, that the SEC is missing or not? Um, you know, I have my... Uh, Concerns about I had my concerns when I was there about the revision restatements and other areas. So we'll, we'll we'll see what what comes out. But I think it's less of a of an acknowledge. It's more of an acknowledgement that, pro, like I said earlier, that proactive sources need to be utilized versus refocusing. It, that's my view. I know other people might disagree with that, but so you, yeah, you, you don't think the case you don't think the cases are out there despite the fact that the pressure's worse. Now than it was in Levitt's day in 1998, you, you you just don't think the cases are out there, or they're hard, I, I don't know whether they're, they're out there. I'm just saying that far. I think that I was addressing whether the division was focused oh, on this case. Sure, they're, they're certainly focused on it, but they're relying too heavily, I think, on the reactive sources, the the, the restatements, the, the whistleblowers, restatements. and the self-reporting. And if the self-reporting dries up on these big matters, and companies are doing investigations behind the scenes and resolving them, then maybe there isn't anything to report, maybe there is. You know, it, it really depends on the, situ on the situation. 
Well, the self-reporting, I think, tends to get driven by, okay, we have to do a restatement, so you may as well call up and self-report because <laughs> well, that's you can tell yeah, everybody yeah, anyways. Yeah. So, you know, you may as well get something for it. You may as well get some cooperation credit or Bank of America, you know, where they where they discovered that problem from when they acquired Merrill Lynch, and right. they had to put out the disclosure and say, well, we value this stuff all wrong. Sorry. I mean, if you've got to do that, yeah. then you may as well self-report. But... The, the question of whether or not you're going to do a restatement, for example, is a big point of contention. You know, and you you sort of have to wonder the numbers have really dropped off, and hopefully that's Sarbanes-Oxley. But personally, I'm skeptical that that's all Sarbanes-Oxley. I, I wonder if we don't have pushing the edge of the envelope, pushing the edge of, well, do we really have to restate this? Couldn't we fix it with a couple of footnotes and, you know, a little bit more text in the MDNA? Well, that's definitely a risk. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, that, right. I mean, there's yeah. no question about that. The question is, are they missing, you know, five, are there five or ten Enrons out there that, that the SEC doesn't right. know about or, or, or even more? Yeah. You know, I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that, right? <laughs> but but there, there are things yeah. you can... I mean, the, yeah. there's some very interesting recent survey evidence of CFOs. Yeah. Uh, people at Duke have been testing... C and they asked C CFOs to estimate how many other CFOs are under pressure to cook the books. You, you can't ask the person, are you yeah. cooking the books? Sure. No, but you're in this world. A and the estimates always tend to cluster around 17, 18, 19 percent. They think that's the incidence of fraud out there at other companies. Uh, that's pretty significant. And, and that's consistent with some other metrics that try, you know, never do this scientifically, but try to estimate, you know, how much fraud we're missing. Uh, and, and that, you know, you could say glass 80 percent full, uh, but 20 percent is worth worrying about. Well, that's a pretty high number of 20 percent. If, if it's 20, yeah, right. And I think embedded, <laughs> embedded in that number is probably yeah. a suspicion that somebody, some other guy is doing it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, there is, but those, I've, I've seen some of those surveys. Mm -hmm. and they've been coming out fairly regularly. I mean, every couple of years, uh, uh, I think Ernst & Young does one. There's some other right. people who do some. And KPMG does and surveys KPMG like that. KPMG does too. surveys mm -hmm. like that. And they're fairly consistent that there's a, a significant percentage. Pick, pick whatever number you want. But it's significant enough to say, Employees and um, CFOs are saying, I think people are, are willing to bend the edge. If I have to make it to EPS, well, you know, if I push that out a little right. bit. And then, then you drop into the other studies that you were talking about, because once you start doing that. Right. And, and it gets back to the rationalization, the, the fraud triangle. Mm -hmm. um, it, once you think everybody else is doing it and your company, which you believe in, is going to get hammered if you don't, mm -hmm. uh, you don't feel terribly guilty. About and you don't send off those signals of uh, of dishonesty because you're just convinced you're playing the same game on uh, on a playing field uh, that everyone else is. Except now that there's a criminal guy, they're more likely to go after you if it's a if it's a major fraud. So there's there could be that calculus, but I, you might have views on whether that is more of a deterrent now than before. Well, I think, personally, I think that I think the criminal stuff is, is a huge, it, it's more of a deterrent than the SEC is just because it's a bigger club. You know, I mean, the threat of going to jail for 15 mm -hmm. years versus getting an injunction and having to pay back your bonus and stuff right. like that. Nobody wants to pay back their bonus. Nobody wants to get kicked out of being an officer or director. But, you know, if, if the choice is 15 years in, in the joint or, you know, I, I lose my job, well, that's that's pretty straightforward. But you know, is let me see, can we pull this together? And what should people out there think about? With this? Not just with the task force, but with their own financial statements, their own financial reporting. We've talked a lot about the text. We've talked a lot about the financial statements. We've talked about the academic studies and and the computers. But what should people out there be looking at um, to maybe improve their disclosures so that? They're doing a better job with this, and it makes it less likely that they run into one of the metrics that we've talked about and, and, and run into the enforcement division. Well, I, I mentioned this before, and there, there are a bunch of lessons, but I think those who are on the front line can be educated on what maybe people at the SEC have been looking at for a long time, and now academic research and data analytics is just improving which is what forces do produce fraud. Become more sophisticated about that.
become more sophisticated about the risk of detection because you know you may be a needle in a haystack, but a computer can crunch pieces of hay very quickly. Um, and so you know, I, I think there's more sunlight than there used to be. And planning an enfor a compliance program and an audit committee program on, the, on those assumptions is probably pretty healthy. Yeah, I think echoing that, doing a, a robust fraud risk assessment, uh, whether it be a county, FCPA, or other regulatory areas is key. Um, making sure your uh, disclosure controls and ICFR controls are, are, are robust and also taking seriously uh, materiality assessments, especially qualitative materiality assessments, is, is important. I, I think it's really a question of uh, moving forward. And, uh, you know, accountants uh, 20 years ago weren't expected to know a lot about valuation. Um, now you're moving towards that and you're going beyond valuation to the point of financial analysis and understanding uh, what users of your financial statements find to be important. So, so I, I think it's, it's an evolving game. And maybe one of the, just to pick up on something you said, Don, maybe one of the things to look for is look for the people who drank the Kool-Aid and look and see if there are incentives to just push the edge because you, you want to have a culture that doesn't say we're going to push the edge. You want to have a culture that says we're going to back off from the edge. We're going to play it down the middle. You have to exercise good judgment. It, it's, it's hard in the sense that you know, hiring that celebrity hard-driving CEO is in everybody's playbook on how to how to look good, um, but Kool Aid could be dangerous, and you know I think audit committees need to be sensitive to that as well as compliance and accounting uh, types as well. Okay. Well, was I like to thank everybody for uh, tuning in. I think we're I think I'm about to get the hook with this panel. I think we're done here. Uh, at least the people off camera look like they're getting ready to pull us off. So. Um, I'd like to thank everybody on the panel today for participating, and, and I'd like to thank everybody who out there is listening to this. I hope, uh, uh, I hope you've uh, uh, got some nice takeaway points from all of this. Have a nice day. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome back to Dorsey's Federal Enforcement Forum. I'm Thomas Lorenzen with Dorsey and & Whitney. And we are now going to turn to a very timely topic, and that is EPA's Information Collection Authority under the environmental statutes. We're going to focus on the Clean Air Act as uh, an exemplar of that authority, but this discussion is really somewhat general. Uh, the timing of this is somewhat auspicious because just yesterday EPA announced one of the most significant environmental um, settlements in its history, uh, the assessment of a $100 million civil penalty against two major auto manufacturers, Hyundai and Kia, for violations of the Federal Clean Air Act. Uh, $100 million in civil penalty, about $200 million in forfeited uh, greenhouse gas emission credits, and an additional $50 million in uh, remedial measures that these companies are going to have to take. How we end up with these sorts of settlements, how the agency finds out that there are violations going on, is in part due to the agency's information collection authority. And with us today to discuss that authority, its extent, how you respond to it when you get an information collection request, and how you manage the document production that is entailed in one of these requests, we have this panel with us today, and I want to introduce our panelists. We're going to start today with Seema Kakade who's with EPA's Office of Enforcement and Compliance Assurance. Uh, she is an attorney advisor in that office. Uh, SEMA primarily handles enforcement cases against stationary sources of pollution under the Clean Air Act, and she focuses on the coal-fired power plant sector. Her work involves information gathering and investigation of new cases, complex settlement negotiations, and litigation. Prior to working at EPA, SEMA was counsel at the U.S. Department of Energy in their Office of the Assistant General Counsel for Environment and she was a staff attorney with the Environmental Law Institute. Also with us today, Thad Lightfoot. Thad is a partner at Dorsey & Whitney's uh, Minneapolis office in our regulatory affairs group. In nearly three decades of practicing environmental law, Thad has represented clients in numerous private party and environmental litigation matters and governmental enforcement actions. He also advises clients regarding compliance with federal, state, and local environmental laws. Uh, Thad has represented corporate clients in a variety of sectors, including mining, forest products, paper, steel, manufacturing, electronics, pharmaceuticals, real estate development, 
and ethanol industries, as well as governmental units and other public entities. Before joining Dorsey and Whitney, Thad was uh, with the pardon me, U.S. Department of Justice in their Environment and Natural Resources Division, where he was an, a trial attorney with the Environmental Enforcement Section and has a good deal of experience in this area. Uh, Thad is also a former legislative assistant for energy and environmental issues to Representative Tom Foley, former Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. Finally with us today is Caroline Sweeney. Caroline is Global Director for eDiscovery and Client Technology Services uh, for Dorsey and Whitney and manages a, an organization which we call Legal Mind Manage Review, uh, which assists clients in managing large-scale document production requests, e-discovery, of the sorts that we would expect to be responding to when a client receives an information collection request from EPA. So uh, what we anticipate today is we'll have a discussion about what EPA's enforcement authority is, what to do when one gets a, an information collection request from EPA, and finally, the mechanics of how to go about producing. So with that, let me turn it over to Seema to start us off. Great. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate everyone's participation today. Um, and as Tom mentioned, as one example of EPA information collection requests, um, we're going to focus today on uh, Clean Air Act Section 114. So next slide, please. Clean Air Act, Section 114, um, we're going to focus there in, in part because 114 tends to produce uh, some of the largest documents in, re in response um, to information collection requests. So they're often, they often can be quite complex. Um, so that's part of the reason why we chose to focus on that for this panel. Um, the first thing that I'd like to talk about is who... Um, might get a Clean Air Act 114 information request. So this first slide um, talks about the who's. And what you'll see is, first of all, uh, that EPA may require any person, so it's discretionary upon the agency. The agency can choose when to do this. Um, who owns or operates any emission source, who manufactures emission control equipment or process equipment, who the administrator believes may have information necessary, or who is subject to any requirement of this chapter. So those are the major who's um, within 114. And I thought it was important to start with sort of the actual language of 114 so that folks who are not familiar with it can see really um, the number of people that really can be subject to a 114 information request. A couple of things that I want to point out um, in, in this on this slide is the Really, EPA could send a 114 information request, usually sends it for two primary purposes. One might be to start an enforcement action or to investigate whether there is a potential violation of the Clean Air Act. Um, another, another area is really in the third bullet that I have on this slide here, which is re with respect to who the administrator believes may have information necessary for the purposes set forth in this subsection. That is often used for, um, for example, for potential EPA rulemakings. If EPA is interested in a rulemaking um, and creating a rulemaking and would like some additional information from, the sec from a specific sector, for example, may issue a pretty broad 114 to a particular source to help gather some of that information for rulemaking. So really what you see um, in 114 is, is two very different ways that you might receive a 114. One is really for the purpose of, of starting an investigation for violations in an enforcement context. The other is a very different purpose, and it's really on the programmatic side of the agency for rulemaking development. The second bullet that you'll see on this slide refers to when. So in an enforcement action, for example, what you might see in a 114 is um, a requirement to do something on a one-time, periodic, or continuous basis. So that is also fairly broad in our statutory authority here. Um, it might be something that lasts for a year. It might be something that you have to do you know, every month for a specific period of time. 
or it might just be a one-time thing. So I also wanted people to see the language of the statute to understand uh, what might be required, when it might be required. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're moving a little bit into what might be required and where it might be required. Um, the statute's pretty detailed here, as you can see. I'm not going to go through every single bullet, but I do want to point out um, a few different things and give you some examples of things that EPA has done on the enforcement side in a 114 um, many times before. Um, for example, the second bullet makes such reports. We've required engineering analysis to be done uh, by companies through 114. Um, install, use, and maintain monitoring equipment. The third bullet on this slide, we regularly require, for example, stack tests to be done uh, for criteria pollutants. Those stack tests may be required to be done in certain circumstances, for example, during startup, because we are particularly interested in what's going on with emissions during startup of a given plant. So we can be specific about uh, timing. Um, we might want sampling of, of, of emissions. So for example, we've required um, sampling of vapors and emissions from tanks before. Um, we might require um, monitoring, for example, continuous emissions monitors to monitor HAPs. Uh, where might those monitors go? Um, we might require that they be on the fence line. We might require that they be off property. Um, so this, this, this slide really does give you an indication of the kinds of things that, that the agency could require, um, and then additionally, where it might be required. So Seema, it's correct to say then that the information collection authority that EPA has is not limited to merely production of information that already exists, but actually an affirmative authority to require people to develop information. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've required reports before. Like I said, we've required engineering analyses. We've required people to actually do something, put out monitors, spend money on doing these things. Um, you know, 114 is not limited in, in that way, that only a certain amount of money might be spent, for example. So there are, you know, where it's pretty broad, and it does allow EPA to ask for a lot of things. Right, but depending upon the actual language of the request, and whether or not it's something that the administrator can reasonably require under Section 114. Section 114 is broad, but it's not unlimited, and we'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. Absolutely, and that, that does lead down to the very last bullet on this slide, which is sort of a catch-all, but you'll see that we do have the phrase, what the administrator may reasonably require, that's in that last bullet. So to the extent that 114 is looking for information or asking a source to do something that doesn't fall within one of the other bullets on this slide and we're using that last bullet, then yes, it is definitely qualified by the term reasonable. Well, actually, actually the term, at least the way I read the statute, the term reasonably require qualifies all three of the possible uses of 114. There are three uses, as, as, as I see it. One is to assist in regulations, which you've discussed. Um, the second, which I think you're going to focus on, is for the administrator to determine whether or not there's a violation. And then third, to carry out the purposes of the Clean Air Act. So it's got to be one, it's got to be reasonably required for the administrator to carry out one of those purposes. Again, very broad, but not unlimited. True. And the one case, uh, the, the, the one really large case that EPA has brought for a Clean Air Act 114 violation was in the Xcel Energy case out of Minnesota a yes. few years ago. And that one was specifically geared towards um, the very last bullet on this slide, which is why I focused there. But right. That's well, it was geared to the last bullet on the slide because EPA argued that actually the second bullet on the slide, the violation bullet, or the violation purpose under 114, uh, was a, a rationale for the request. And the, the, the court said no. Uh, that's not correct, but then it allowed the agency to go forward with a 114 request because it found that the request was reasonably required for the administrator to carry out other purposes of the Clean Air Act. Right, that's correct. And what it, and to, to to develop what happened in the Excel case a little bit more, um, that case was not only looking at getting information from the source about what has happened in the past or what is currently happening, but was really asking for information about what may happen in the future. And that was in particular with respect to what's known as the Prevention of Significant Deterioration New Source Review Program, which is really a forward-looking permitting program as to activities that a source might be doing in the future. And so it was it was tied it was tied to those that type of investigation. So that's it's an interesting case. It's um 
a case that really focused in on 114. So right, and it was the, at least as I re remember the case, it was the PSD look back. Uh, issue that the court said, no, that's not within the scope of 114. But looking forward, as you just mentioned, Seema, the court said, yes, that's within the scope of the administrator to carry out the provisions of the Clean Air Act. Right. Um, next slide, please. And going off of uh, Tom's, Tom's question, um, this is further information in, that we have in one, that guides us in 114 that really does describe um, not only is it, a, is it a potentially request for documents, for example, but it, might, it, it, also, it also looks towards EPA's ability to get on property um, and inspect. And when we, when we have the authority to do that, um, I think it's pretty clear in, this, in, the, in the language here. Again, it's pretty, it's pretty broad. There's not, you know, there's not a focus on giving notice to a source before EPA comes. It really focuses on presentation of credentials. Um, and so it's not just a matter of, of documents that we're focused on here. It really can be uh, EPA's access to property as well and, 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 and getting records on site. Next slide, please. So these are a few other things that I wanted to talk about with respect to sort of other issues that come up um, for the agency with respect to Clean Air Act Section 114, and I, I think uh, Thad probably will talk about this a little bit in his presentation as well, um, but I'll kick off a couple of things from EPA's perspective. Um, the first bullet that I have here is with respect to confidential business information, and what I think sources really need to understand is that um, sources are absolutely entitled to claim any information that's given to EPA as CBI. Um, your, in, your information requests that you receive often in the cover letter will describe um, the, the process by which you might want to assert CBI, the regulate our CBI regulations. Um, so it's probably useful to read that. Um, your CBI assertion is exactly that. It's an assertion. Um, EPA it's often, often will do a, a CBI determination to determine whether that information is actually CBI in the agency's determination. So sometimes these processes, 114 processes, can get on completely different tracks and we're in a dispute on whether the information, underlying information, is CBI or not. So that's something to be mindful of. Um, EPA sharing of CBI, um, our 40 CFR Part 2 and Part 3 regulations govern when EPA might share CBI, for example, with the Department of Justice. Again, we are investigating potential violations of the Clean Air Act. A lot of the, a lot of the information we get in our 114 requests might go into the development, for example, of a referral of a violation to the Department of Justice, and so there might be a need to share CBI information uh, with with the Department of Justice, so we have rules that govern that sharing. Um, well, Seema, while you're on CBI, are there instances where EPA shares confidential business information with, for instance, outside entities beyond the federal government, let's say non-governmental organizations who might also be pursuing actions or investigations? Yeah, so um, non-governmental, we, for one example, is a contractor. EPA does work with contractors fairly regularly to de help develop cases, and again, 40 CFR Part 2 and 3 goes into our ability to share with contractors and what needs to be done there. Um, but I think your question, Tom, is maybe pointed a little bit more towards non-governmental uh, public citizen groups, for example. Um, and really the way that turns out is through FOIA. If we are FOIA'd for the CBI response, which often we are, we are under FOIA obligations to release information that we can release through FOIA. Now, if it's CBI protected, it does not go out through a FOIA, but that does often trigger the, EP, uh, the agency's need to do a full CBI determination. Yes, right. Um, so that's just something to, for folks to be mindful of, that uh, CBI, while you are asserting CBI on your documents, and sometimes, you know, we have sources that produce a large amount of information and none of it's claimed CBI. And sometimes we have um, sources that produce a large amount of information and all of it is claimed CBI. So it really does depend on, on the sector. It really does depend on, on, on the individual case. Um, 
The other two uh, bullets on this slide that I want to quickly address are with respect to um, negotiating 114 requests with EPA and then also expectation or consideration of a supplemental or sometimes we refer to it as a follow-up 114 request. So 114 requests can be complex, they can be long, they can be time-consuming. Um, we often are negotiating um, Clean, Clean Air Act 114 information requests in, in many different ways. We negotiate the timeliness of them, for example. Um, we might expect that you can produce 114 information in a certain period of time. You may think you need longer, so that's often things that we negotiate. We sometimes negotiate a staggered production in the same way you might for civil discovery, for example. We often will negotiate the actual substance. Uh, would, I think the monitor might go better here versus here, that type of thing. Um, sometimes we negotiate the form in which you might submit 114 requests. So those are all examples of areas that we would negotiate a 114 request. Um, and then I also just want to mention that we often do send follow-up 114 requests. So sometimes we'll get a response, start the investigation, and, oh, we should have asked this question, or we still have questions about this, or they didn't quite adequately answer this question. You might see a follow-up 114 that is shorter or more specific to one, th one piece of information in your production, for example. So just be aware of that. And then the very last thing that I wanted to mention is 114 violations. Um, we, we do consider 114 violations to be important for the agency. Um, we have brought 114 cases before um, for, you know, improper withholding, improper redaction, um, refusal to give information. So that's something to be mindful of that if you are with, withholding, if you are redacting, you know, expect um, a phone call probably from an EPA attorney to discuss that, um, you know, potentially at some point a referral to the Department of Justice for a 114 violation. So that's something to keep in mind. The more you can cooperate on um, the actual response with, with, the, enforce, with the enforcement folks, uh, the better I think you'll be. Thank you, Simone. Before we turn it over to Thad, one, one further question. What sort of basis does the agency have to have before it can submit a request to an entity? I mean, must you have some evidence, or can it really be for any reason? Um, it's got, it goes back to the beginning of 114 and the beginning of the language of the 114, which I tried to include in the very first slide. It can't um, be for any reason, Tom. Right. Right. It is, it is broad. Um, I, I will say that I think it is very broad, um, but it does need to be reasonably tied to a specific purpose that this 114 allows. Very good. So, Thad, you are representing a client who uh, has received from EPA a, a letter. And I've done that a few times. <laughs> in which EPA asks for a good deal of information about current practices, past practices, asks EPA to install some monitoring equipment, uh, prepare some reports, what should the client do? Uh, well, run through the house screaming. No, I shouldn't say that. Uh, first thing the client should do is take the request seriously, and that's if we go to the next slide. Uh, you know, if SEMA hasn't uh, scared the heck out of you uh, over the last 20 minutes, uh, let me try to do that. Um, you really do need to take the request seriously, and, and here is the reason why. Uh, there are severe penalties that are associated with Section 114, statutory maximum of uh, $37,500 uh, per day. Um, and, and you really, it is easy to get uh, crosswise with the agency uh, if the request isn't taken seriously and isn't responded to or the process doesn't start with respect to responding to the request right away. Uh, you can't really wait. We're going to talk about schedules in a few minutes. Um, Seema mentioned negotiating uh, essentially a rolling, not a rolling production, but a, a nego a negotiating a staggered schedule. That's fine, but typically when you get a 114, the agency won't offer a staggered schedule. Uh, it will give you 30 days to respond, uh, which, uh, you know, I, I hate to say it, Seema, but that's not enough time. Uh, <laughs> and so in most cases. And so that's when the, that's when the dialogue needs to begin with the, uh, with the, um, uh, with, with the regulator, but uh, it can't begin on day 29. Uh, so you've got to get a hold of these issues very quickly. 
uh, retain uh, experienced counsel, and not just an experienced environmental lawyer, but somebody who has actually dealt in the context with Section 114 of the Clean Air Act before, because it is a different animal than other uh, information uh, request authorities uh, under the agency, and in some respects uh, the most uh, the most difficult. Um, what I'm going to focus primarily on uh, on addressing. Uh, production of narrative and documents as opposed to dealing with reports uh, and the like, because I, I found that in some, re in some respects, uh, dealing with the requirement of reports or dealing with the requirement of including uh, installing monitoring and the like, that is a, those, those issues are, tend to be more technical. They'll involve consultants. Um, and there's a lot more back and forth with the agency on those. Uh, they also tend to be, they, although the agency does that, um, they tend not to be, at least in my experience, in the first 114. Oftentimes they'll be in follow-up. That, that information will come and be requested in follow-up uh, 114 requests. So, so let's start with um, how you would uh, take a, a, a 114 request that may ask you to do uh, something affirmatively in terms of uh, installing uh, monitoring and the like, but also, but primarily focus us on responding with respect to narrative uh, and and providing information. Uh, the first thing, as, as I say in the next point two on this on the slide, is to assemble a client team. Often these 114 facilities, you think, or 114 requests um, aren't just limited to a single facility. If, if a company has multiple facilities, it may go to uh, a number of those facilities. And even if it's just one facility, it could touch on a whole host of processes within that facility. So you're going to, I have rarely seen a circumstance in a Section 114 response where it's just one or two people at a company who have the information to be able to respond to a 114 request. It just doesn't happen. And so the first thing that you need to do if you receive one of these requests is to assemble a client team of people who are knowledgeable about the specific information that's requested uh, in the 114. So some of that's going to be going to be uh, driven by uh, the actual uh, information request. And it's not just environment, health, and safety staff. It could be manufacturing staff. Uh, it could be maintenance staff. It could be executives. Um, uh, as I said, it's almost never just one or two people. It's usually a team. The third point that I suggest is to evaluate the nature and scope of the of the entire request. You can often tell from the way the request is written, from the actual uh, specific information uh, that the agency is seeking, of where the focus uh, where the focus is. Um, it's it's usually you know reasonably easy to tell the agencies. Uh, if the agency is in an enforcement focus. You'll, you'll know that from the way uh, the 114 is drafted. And the other thing to remember is that it's not the information requests under Section 114 um, don't, aren't necessarily just limited to the Clean Air Act. Uh, there are many other statutes that uh, allow the EPA uh, to request information, and I've frequently seen inf information requests under Section 114, which also ask questions uh, concerning release reporting under the Emergency uh, Planning and Community Right to Know Act, for example. So understand that it may not be limited uh, just, to section, uh, just to Section 114. The, the other thing that I suggest that clients do, again, with, uh, with their, their in-house or uh, experienced outside lawyers or both, um, is in evaluating the nature and scope of the request is to go through with the client, well, go through with the legal team first and then bring the client in to annotate those requests and discuss the approach early um, in an annotated uh, uh, 114 request. Um, so you can tease out questions that are, questions that are vague, terms that aren't defined, and the like. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. But it's very important to do that early. You do not want to be at day 28 when your uh, response is due two days later and realize that one of the facilities has interpreted something completely differently than the other five facilities uh, that received a similar Section 114. Uh, and then finally, the last point, and, and I won't belabor this as Seema uh, mentioned it as well, but don't be afraid to negotiate a response schedule with the agency. Some questions are easier for your client to answer than other questions. Uh, some questions are more important to EPA in a 114 yes. than other questions. It makes perfect sense to engage in an early discussion of that information so you can say, all right, within this unreasonable 30-day requirement, <laughs> SEMA, um, we can make 
a series of the, we can respond to questions 2, 4, 6, and 18. Within 60 days, we're going to need a little more time, and here's the reason, and we'll respond to this set of questions. That's, I think it's a good, that, you know, that's it's pretty a very good common. Point. It's a very you know, good point, Thad, because there are questions. You can also ask the agency, you know, well, we think we can respond to these right. first. Well, which ones would you like us to right. respond to right. first? And that can be part right. of the negotiation. And, and that, way, that way you're not, that way you're focusing on, one, one, what's what's reasonable for the client to do, um, but two, what the agency wants. And you're not spending a lot of time and a lot of resources generating a lot of information that the agency might look at. It'll ultimately look at it, but it might be of secondary importance. Correct. Okay, um, okay so uh, next slide, uh, please. Uh, first, first, Before you go to the next your slide. lights are on. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Before you go to the next slide, uh, let me announce for those who are uh, taking this course to obtain New York, continuing legal education credit, you need to write down the following code, ZKT514. Again, that is ZKT514. Receptionists are standing by to take your order now. <laughs> Back to our course. I feel like I shouldn't yell bingo at this point, but, uh, but, I, but I guess not. Okay, so the next slide, and we've talked a little bit about interpretation of uh, information requests, but let me just reiterate how important it is to early on make consistent decisions as early as possible with respect to how you're going to interpret the requests and either discuss those with the agency if you believe that they will be controversial or if you don't believe they'll be controversial or you just don't want to talk to the agency at that point, um, which often, which, which can happen, then please explain them. Please explain what you've done in some sort of cover letter and in the actual narrative of the information request. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll find that, I mean, again, and I'm not trying to criticize the, I, mean, I used to represent the agency, <laughs> so I'm not trying to criticize the agency, but often 114 requests like discovery um, will contain few definitions. Some of them are vague. Some of the terms are vague. Sometimes a time limit isn't set with respect to uh, with, res set with respect to some questions and not to others. And so you can make judgments about those. But when you do that, do them early on with the client. Involve EPA if it's appropriate. But please tell EPA what you're doing, uh, or it, it can be uh, it can be unfortunate uh, down the down the line. Uh, for example, and we've got a, got got some examples here. Um, are you going to look at what? Are you going to look at documents and other information in? Uh, in uh, the custody of consultants and contractors. I typically uh, tell clients not to do that uh, unless the information request specifically asks for you to do that. But let the agency know you're not going to do that. Let the agency know that you have not contacted consultants and contractors to try to find responsive information. You could do so if you had additional time and if that's what the agency wants, but you're not going to do that in the first instance, but let the agency know. Um, you may be, it may be a certain a circumstance where you're not, you're, you've decided you're not searching regulatory files because uh, the, you assume that the agency has what the state has uh, or the agency has what the agency has. And so you're looking for your own, at your own client's files and your own client information uh, and, you're, and not interviewing, for example, current or former employees unless you need that actual information to respond uh, fully to the information request and the narrative with respect to the information request. And then with respect to time limits, uh, you, you've got to, uh, 114 requests often set time limits. Um, sometimes they're reasonable, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they don't set, sometimes information requests don't set time limits at all. So you really need uh, to, to bracket end dates in a way uh, and do that consistently throughout uh, throughout the, the response to the request. Okay, um, next uh, next slide. Um, additional considerations, confidential business information, and SEMA uh, spent uh, spent some time on this. But let me just uh, talk about it a bit from the perspective of the uh, of the regulated community of those those poor regulated parties uh, toiling <laughs> out to toiling out there. Well, I mean, poor not not financially, but I mean toiling out there in the vineyards. Confidential business information is very important because it is, as Seema pointed out, it is your assertion of confidential business information. You've got to be, but and what you have to do, and there are specific uh, there are specific requirements uh, in in 40 CFR Part Two uh, of what constitutes con continental con uh, uh, confidential business information or CBI. But what's 
critical is you, in order to assert a CBI claim, you've got to show that you haven't waived it. That means you haven't given it to your trade association, that it's protected information and protected within your own uh, within your own company. So not every, you know, the, the janitor who is dumping uh, the, the, uh, the trash cans at the end of the day doesn't have access to it, um, that it is not reasonably obtainable by others. In other words, it's not public information already, uh, and that it would cause substantial harm to the company uh, in, in the co and harm the company's competitive position if it's released. So those are, those are issues that you should be thinking about when you make con uh, con uh, CBI claims. Not every, I mean, clients often think everything is CBI. And I have to tell you, everything is not CBI. You've got to be able to help the agency make a determination if it comes to that by providing the information. And there are, there are techniques to do it, and we can talk about that maybe a little more later. Um, Attorney-client privilege, just don't forget about it. I guarantee you, you will find attorney-client privilege documents when you look at the information requests from uh, in, in under Section 114, so don't forget about the privilege. Um, with respect to objections, really, I think the focus here is, is this information that the, the administrator reasonably requires? Um, that's really the point. Yes, 114 is very broad, but it's not unlimited. I mean, I, I've seen EPA information requests that ask for the number of employees at a facility. I have to tell you, I don't think that that's reasonably required for the administrator to determine whether the facility has violated the Clean Air Act. I'm not saying don't answer it, but I do think you need to consider those types of objections and overbroad questions, questions that are beyond uh, the authority uh, of the agency. Um, finally, with respect to certification, and this is a very important, something that's very important uh, to clients. EPA will always ask uh, the, 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 in the, uh, the party that's submitting the information to certify the information. By certifying, certifying the information, that means that certifying the information is correct. Now, the, the issue here is that sometimes the agency will, get, will provide a form of certification, and if they do, you may be able to talk to the agency about that a little bit, but it's difficult. Sometimes the agency won't provide a form of certification, but no matter what, it is unlikely that the single person that is certifying the 114 request has personal knowledge of all the information within uh, the information that's responsive to that request. So it's important uh, to reflect that concept somehow in the certification to say that although I don't have personal knowledge of everything, they were the, the information was prepared uh, in a diligent effort to provide that information by individuals that knew about the information, and I believe, those, as a result, I believe those responses are accurate. It's important because of, uh, your client can get into severe consequences by certifying that information is accurate when it turns out not to be accurate, and so you do not want your Vice President for Environment and Health and Safety to certify that he knows everything in a 100,000-page information response to the Environmental Protection Agency. Talk for a moment about the standard for uh, the certification and the potential consequences for a an erroneous certification, a false certification, and that that could be I well. I mean, false certifications are. I mean, I mean, the, the, the agency is going to say that it's. It, you know, you have the same problem that you have. Uh, for falsifying your tax returns, uh, 5 U.S.C. 1001, you can end up in, you know, you can end up wearing orange, uh, or you can end up in federal prison uh, with, a, with a certification that is inaccurate or a certification that is outright false. And that's why, I mean, the agency doesn't want parties to certify if they can't truly certify. What the agency wants to know is, I think, that there's been a diligent effort to pull the information together and to talk to those people who have the who have knowledge of the information. And so long as the certification makes those points without kind of putting your uh, environment health without putting your, your executive vice president out you know, onto the plank to saw it off later. Um, I, I think that and that makes sense. And I've had good luck with the agency in talking about okay you put this in the certification, but here's our concern about it. And, and the agency will um, not always modify a certification, but they at least understand the problem. Mm -hmm. All right. So you talked for a minute about objections to an information collection request. And let's say you've been talking with the EPA about the information collection request, trying to narrow it, but you're at loggerheads. You can't get there. How do you deal with that? 
Well, that's difficult, but I mean, if, if you're loggerheads with the agency and, and, um, you run a grave risk if you just tell the agency, uh, forget it, we're not going to provide the information. Uh, because you are, that's, we talk about a supplemental request or a follow-up request. I guarantee, ladies and gentlemen, that you will see a follow-up request, uh, or maybe a referral to the Department of Justice, um, on those issues. So if you really can't convince the agency, that your position is reasonable, then you're going to have to take another approach. And sometimes that means providing the information or providing the information over strenuous objections that are articulated. An objection doesn't mean you're not going to provide the information. An objection is there to preserve your right to argue that you didn't have to provide the information in the first instance if it ever comes to that. See, any response to that? No, I think that's right. I mean, it's it, it, Thad made, have, has made a lot of... Um, comparisons to, for example, a civil discovery process, and I think those comparisons are fair. Um, you know, noted on the objections that it's not it, it's not that you're not providing the information; you're just preserving that objection. Um, the only other thing I guess I'll add is that we do sometimes see folks, um, in an effort to show that they're trying to be cooperative, there's this there's this that we just are not agreeing to. So. That doesn't mean that we're not going to produce the response in general. We may redact, for example, um, a, a few lines in here to show that, well, the rest of this information is here. Right. We're providing this overall context. Maybe, you know, these few lines we're going to redact out. So we have seen things like that before. doesn't mean we're not going to continue to push to get that information because we might believe that's improper redaction for a number of other reasons, but that's also something that we've seen. All right. Thank you both. And so, you just said that this is basically like civil discovery in certain <laughs> respects. That, I think, brings us to our final panelist today, Caroline Sweeney, who manages massive civil discovery requests and also uh, provision of information and response to information collection requests. So, let's talk for a little bit about the mechanics of making this happen. How do you translate this request into a production of documents that is responsive to what EPA wants? So the first thing um, you're going to want to do is start identifying the custodians of potentially relevant information. And that typically means going to the key individuals that you have identified and documenting um, your discussion with them to, to find out what information do they have. Is, is it stored? And where is that information stored? Is it in email? Is it stored in documents on their desktop? Is it in a project folder? on um, a SharePoint site or on a file server? Is it information stored with a third-party vendor or a, um, in a proprietary database? So you want to go about documenting or identifying where the information is and who has it. Um, as part of that process, it's also typically wise to speak to IT staff so that you can make sure um, sometimes the IT staff might have like a data map that tells you this is the different repositories that we use within the organization and this is where information might be stored. So that can be helpful to, to that identification process. As well as speaking to the records management staff, getting an understanding of the type of documents, the type of records the organization generates and what the retention is around those documents so you have a sense of, of what there is and how long it's retained. Um, another best practice is um, to potentially issue a preservation notice so that you've documented for, uh, for the organization that you have communicated to the key individuals their obligation to preserve and ensure that information, potentially relevant information, is not destroyed. And likewise, making sure that the IT staff is um, informed that they should not or potentially need to look at um, uh, uh, not continuing with routine purge policies on um, uh, electronic information and also talking to the record staff and making sure that uh, routine disposition of, or destruction of, of, of documents is, is, um, is held off on until such time that you've complied with the request. You also want to be able to understand accessibility concerns. So if information is stored with a third party um, or you have information in a legacy system that is going to be costly and burdensome for the organization to collect, you want to be able to identify that, to document that, and I think to be able to have a conversation with um, the EPA around that inaccessible information and how you're going to handle that going forward. Once you've done the identification exercise, you want to start the collection exercise. And again, you might, um, if you are 
prioritizing your <coughs> collection or your responses, you might do some prioritization around the collection protocol, but you want to identify uh, the resources that you have to conduct the collection. Are you going to have um, the organization provide you with the, the information, or are you going to bring in a third party to help with the, the collection of the electronic information? And I should say, too, don't forget that hard copy is still quite relevant, and we also need to make sure that it is uh, collected and preserved. And again, as a, as a best practice, um, you want to document your collection process. Who collected, when did they collect, and what tools were, were used so that you are showing that you are um, making best efforts to comply with the request. Once you've identified, you've collected, you've ensured that preservation is taking place, the next step, and you can go to the next slide, sorry. Um, the next step is the processing of the information. And what we are assuming here is that, particularly in a lar large volume uh, case, your, or document case, document intensive, you're going to put everything into a centralized repository so you can most efficiently review and produce it. So we go through a stage called processing, and it's at this point that we're really looking at ways that we can start to reduce the volume of documents that require eyes on review, because that is typically a very costly aspect of um, an exercise such as this in, in preparing for production. One of the first steps in doing that data reduction is discussing deduplication, which is an automatic way to re remove from the, the collection of documents, of, of electronically stored information, um, exact duplicates. So if I have a document um, on my desktop and you have that same document um, stored on your desktop, we could deduplicate across custodians and put only one of those documents into the review population. Now you have to be aware of what the production requirements are from the EPA because if they are saying uh, we want you to produce all copies um, in the possession of every different custodian, you don't want to do global deduplication, you want to do custodian level deduplication. Um, you also want to look at whether or not you can provide uh, or apply date calls to limit the, the, the scope of the collection. You might want to use uh, search terms to be able to really target in on uh, potentially relevant data. If somebody has produced an entire um, mailbox, email box, because they don't organize it by particular issues, using search terms to drill down to the documents that you might have to, or that are potentially relevant and that you have to review is a good way to reduce that volume. Now, certainly you want to vet your search terms to make sure you're not returning no hits or you're retur not returning tens of thousands of hits, and you probably also want to have a conversation with um, the agency to explain what you're doing to reduce the data volumes. Um, also being aware of some of the new technology out there that during the processing stage can help flag PII in documents so that you know that there are certain documents that might require redaction. And at this stage, we would also typically, to Thad's point about don't forget about privilege, we would typically run potential privilege search terms and flag documents that are potentially privileged so we're sure that those get reviewed and treated accordingly. We really encourage the use of technology to expedite the review and ensure both consistency and quality of the review. So some of the, um, if you go to the next slide, some of the technology capabilities that are out there would include auto-coding. So in the example I was talking about earlier where you have deduped within custodian, so we have my document and the duplicative copy of your document in the collection, we can set up auto-coding in some platforms that would allow me to look at the doc only one copy of the document and replicate that coding to the duplicates in the database. That way we're ensuring the documents are consistently coded, we're reducing the number of documents and therefore the time and the dollars it takes to conduct the review. Um, some of the other technology you might want to take a look at is email threading and being able to organize email threads so that you're looking at the entire string or series of strings, I guess, um, all at once and being able to treat them consistently with respect to 
CBI redactions, privilege redactions, whether or not the document is in fact relevant. Um, at Dorsey, we are big believers in using concept clustering and various analytic tools to help us organize the documents um, by concept so that you're looking at similarly conceptually similar documents in our experience that helps speed the review process it ensures consistency um, and is we're able to achieve much higher productivity rates um, also helps us to conduct quality control so if we know here is a pool of documents um, that are flagged as C containing CBI if we cluster them with the entire universe um, of documents that we're going to produce, we can see where they're organized with similar documents that might also require CBI redactions. Um, predictive coding is a whole other topic, but, um, but that is also a potential way of making sure that um, you're reducing your review time. Um, with respect to the review, you also want to be thinking about who's going to be conducting the review. Oftentimes, if you're dealing with a very limited time frame, you are going to maybe not want to use law firm associates to conduct the review because they are pulled in different directions, they're more costly, et cetera. Um, so what you might want to consider is dedicated staff and using lower cost contract attorneys to actually help with the review process. And I think something that's very important, um, certainly you might, for your organization, want to be creating a, a budget of what this is all going to cost to conduct the review, but certainly you want to understand what the timeline is so, um, so that you are able to staff the, the review project appropriately. So we had a, a case where we knew we had, a, after going through the processing and the collection and what have you, we knew we had about 130,000 documents that needed to be produced in four weeks. Um, we knew that we had a rather complex protocol that we were going to be doing issue coding that we were going through and identifying multiple data requests. And so we were able to determine, not to mention redactions and what have you, we were able to estimate that we would review those documents at a rate of approximately 25 documents an hour. And we were able to then say, okay, we need a team of about 35 contract attorneys to meet the deadline. So those are some of the exercises that you want to go through, I think, as you're planning this review project. Um, with respect to the actual review, next slide, please. Um, you want to, or we would encourage that you document your review protocol. So this is the instruction to your review team on what it is they're going to be reviewing, what categories of information they're going to be capturing, and I list a number of different um, categories that might be appropriate. You also want to make sure that you conduct training for your review team. Um, that means reviewing with them the, the data requests, the key individuals, the types of documents that they might be seeing. Perhaps going through, or actually we would say we would require going through some sample coding. Um, so pulling up some documents from the collection and having the lead um, attorney on the matter kind of talk through the thought process of how this document would be flagged for relevancy, for what data requests you might apply it to, what redactions you might apply, et cetera. Um, you also want to make sure, back to Thad's point, I think about what constitutes CBI, that it's at this point in this training protocol that you are instructing the review team as to what you expect them to be identifying and therefore flagging as CBI. We would encourage you to look at different types of redactions. So as you're flagging a document for redaction, also indicating the type of redaction. Is it for privilege purposes? Is it for PII? Is it for CBI? So that you can go back and easily identify where those redactions were made. And if you do have a situation where you have to reproduce um, unre in unredacted form, you can easily identify those and, and not have to go through an exercise of re-reviewing everything. And finally, it's a very important part of this whole review process is quality control and making sure that throughout the process you're doing random sampling of the review uh, or of the contract attorney work product that you are um, ensuring that they are adhering to the review protocol and applying the, the data request numbers, the um, redactions, et cetera, the privilege calls as you 
as you expected them or as you um, were intending to instruct them. And we've also had situations where not only do we have a lead attorney on the legal team that's overseeing um, and serving kind of as the escalation points for questions that come up during the review process, but we might have a client also participate in that process, particularly if we're dealing with very technical information. So we've had, you know, the, the maybe people from the engineering team on site to help us understand documents or explain information and make the right calls or participate in the QC process. The final step in this process is actual production. And as that pointed out, you want to make sure that you're building in time to get your production out the door. Particularly if you're doing a lot of redaction work, not only do you need to make sure you're, um, you're burning in your redactions to the documents, but then if you're providing uh, searchable text, you need to have time to make sure that you are after redactions doing the OCR process so that you're not turning over the very text of the very information that um, you are attempting to redact. You want to make sure that you've um, got the proper endorsements, your bait stamping schema, your confidentiality designations on the documents. You want to have had a discussion with um, the agency with respect to production format. Are you producing searchable PDFs? Are you producing native files? Are you producing um, documents to, or a load file to go into a particular database um, that they will then use to review the productions. And you want to make sure that you're conducting that final production quality control. And again, we, we have found great success in using analytics tools to make sure that, um, to, 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 as part of that quality control process. So we can see visually how documents are clustering of similar contact and, uh, content and making sure that they are treated sim or identically before um, we actually turn them over for production. So that, in a nutshell, are some of the practical <laughs> steps for um, making sure that you are identifying and producing properly. Great. Thank you, Caroline. That leaves us with about five minutes for questions and answers. I want to pose to you sort of a, a difficult situation that I know comes up occasionally. I want you to discuss how it gets dealt with. Uh, a, company, a company's internal counsel thinks that something may be happening at the plant that might not be quite kosher. And they send a request to the technical staff, could you please put together a report for me? And run an audit or something. And the uh, staff goes together and puts together a report, and sure enough, there's, there, there's a problem. And that is then sent back to counsel in a memorandum or some other form. And then an EPA information collection request arrives. That sounds like attorney-client information. How does one deal with that? How does the agency deal with it? How does one deal with it in terms of producing it or not producing it? Uh, you're right, that's a difficult question. I mean, it sounds like attorney-client, but it may not be attorney-client just because um, the, the, I mean, it's, a, it's a common problem. Um, is the general counsel acting in a legal capacity or uh, in a business capacity at that point when he tasks a non-lawyer, an in-house person, not retained by outside counsel to, to assist outside counsel in providing advice to the client to do a report? Uh, if it's an audit, there might be some there might be some protections uh, under EPA's audit policy and under various state audit policies. Uh, if it's not an audit, uh, I think there is an argument that it's privileged. Um, I'm not sure that the agency would agree with that argument. Uh, in the first instance, I do not, I, I wouldn't counsel a client to turn that over. I'd try to make a privilege argument with the general counsel understanding that the privilege argument might, at the end of the day, uh, not prevail in a court of law. All right. Seema, this isn't litigation yet. How does the agency treat assertions of attorney-client privilege in response to information collection requests? Well, I'll say that it is a problem. We do see, um, well, I think what we deal with the majority of time is, is uh, respondents who don't do what that is suggesting. They do not provide any basis for the privilege assertion at all. And that, I would say, you got to start at least there. Um, you know, depending on where that lands, there's a lot of questions that can come up. Maybe it would lead to some sort of litigation. But if you don't even assert the privilege in a proper format, 
that's really problematic. So I guess that's, you know, where the direction goes after that is tough to say. Um, is this but, a matter that can be negotiated between the parties? Um, it probably could, in my experience. People, um, it's tough to talk about the attorney-client privilege without giving attorney-client protected information. Yeah, you're really, it's very <laughs> hard to do that. Um, you know, there, there are some, there have been some arguments that, that, that uh, people have made in the past about engineering tests and confidential business information, and you know, clients and the agency have different different uh, approaches there. I think it's easier to discuss CBI in some respects. It's easier to discuss CBI issues because you know what those facts are. They're in 40 CFR Part Two. Um, you can you can build an argument. Privilege issues are much tougher. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Thank you, Thad. Caroline's just laid out all the steps that have to go into producing the documents and other information in response to these information requests. And typically, this is about the historical production, not about the generation of new reports, right, but right. what's in the client's files that, that is evidence of their past conduct and performance. When do you start that process of developing the, the, uh, the inform information collection procedures within the client. How do you evaluate that? How do you communicate that to the agency in terms of negotiating a schedule? Well, you have to start it immediately, as I said. Otherwise, I mean, there's just you saw what the the the, the daunting process <laughs> uh, that that uh, that uh, Carolyn put together. And, and in my experience, that has been exactly the process. And when you're dealing with fifty thousand pages or a hundred thousand pages or more, uh, it's a, it's it's a real challenge. So you want to start it as early as possible, um, and you also want to let the agency know. You know, we've done some initial cuts uh, with respect to your carefully crafted information request, and we figured out that it's going to be about 100,000 pages. So we're going to need more time and, and just based on the volume of information. And again, that gets back to the dealing with maybe some questions are easier to answer than others and going forward that way. All right. We have about one minute left. Any final thoughts on information collection requests, what EPA seeks, what, how you respond, or how you deal with them technically? I will say, and in my experience, I think the agency is, not always, and not every person in the agency, but the agency is definitely willing to discuss some of these difficult issues. And for that, those of us who toil in the vineyards are very pleased. <laughs> we try to, and this is you know, always the start of an investigation, and it's a process. And so we might be working with you for a very long time, either in settlement of a violation or in litigation. So might as well start off on the right foot. All right. We have concluded our hour. I thank you all for joining us for this session on EPA's Information Collection Authority. Again, for people uh, taking the New York uh, CLE credit for this, the code is ZKT514. We'll take a short break and be back in 15 minutes for the next panel on FERC and the CTFC. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, how you all doing? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for joining our third and final panel today, uh, which concerns uh, recent trends in FERC, uh, CFTC, and other agency uh, enforcement matters. My name is uh, Joe Hall. I am the co-chair of uh, Dorsey's Energy Group, which provides services to power industry, oil and gas industry participants. I'm very excited because we have a wonderful panel today for uh, our discussion. Uh, with me to my right, uh, we have uh, Dina Wiggins. Uh, Dina is the president and CEO of the Natural Gas Supply Association. And uh, prior to her association, prior to her current position, Dina had been in private practice uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, to uh, Dina's right, we have uh, Tom Gorman, who is one of my uh, colleagues. Uh, Tom is a uh, member of uh, Dorsey's trial group and has extensive experience uh, prosecuting and defending uh, federal enforcement actions at the SEC, CFTC, and at FERC. Uh, Tom works with me on power issues and our oil and gas attorneys on uh, oil and gas uh, compliance and enforcement matters. And uh, finally, to Tom's right, we have Sean Ledgerwood. Uh, Sean is a principal with the Brattle Group. Uh, Sean and Dina currently reside in the Washington, D.C. office of their current, um, uh, of their respective organizations, and we are very thankful to have them with us today. Um,
in terms of the objective of this panel, really what we want to do is have a conversation amongst ourselves for the benefit of the audience. <laughs> and uh, I put the emphasis here on conversation as opposed to a lecture and thinking about uh, what I want you all to walk away with uh, in terms of a value-added deliverable, I think we want to do three things here. Uh, first and foremost, I want um, both the, the panelists and the, audience, and, and the audience to understand that they are not alone in um, perhaps scratching their heads uh, as we as attorneys or business advisors look out into the market and try to evaluate the current landscape of um, market manipulation and enforcement cases. I think there is a lot of ambiguity, uh, purposely so by the agencies, that creates a lot of risk intolerance, um, regardless of whatever your relationship is with the uh, different markets. And uh, as attorney advisors and as consultants, I think we sometimes find ourselves hesitating to ans answer specific questions because we really, we really aren't seeing too much guidance from the agencies. So. Um, be, uh, uh, be aware that uh, you're not the only people who struggle with these issues, and we hope that by engaging in this conversation, you'll have a little more perspective, and then uh, we'll have a set of fresh eyes on any compliance or litigation you may be working with. Uh, the second objective is really just to give you, again, the perspective of having Dina and Sean and Tom uh, give their thoughts on current issues we seem to be um, uh, facing in the market, whether it's um, FERC investiga investigations, CFTC investigations, uh, trade press, uh, consent agreements. I think there's a lot of value sometimes in just hearing what other members of the community are seeing in their uh, particular relationships. So you can perhaps engage a certain compliance question you have and evaluate your risk tolerance or evaluate whether or not you want to be more aggressive or less aggressive in any type of litigation. Uh, and finally, the, the last thing we'd like to accomplish today is, of course, to you know, give you, a, the audience, an uh, opportunity to ask us any questions, uh, perhaps anonymously. Uh, please email us uh, with any questions you may have. Uh, to the extent we can answer them right now, we will. To the extent we need to follow up and um, you know, do a one-on-one, -on -one, we're certainly willing to do that. So with the uh, introductions made and the objectives stated, um, why don't we just jump right in here and... Um, uh, start talking about you know what we've seen over the last year or two in the market. Um, you know I've been doing this stuff for you know 15 years, and the last six or seven I've spent a significant amount of time working on uh, FERC enforcement issues. And I can say the uh, the uh, the cases are coming faster, they're more aggressive, and they're more complex. And I sit here uh, in 2014. Uh, wondering, you know, what, if anything, uh, we've seen over the last, you know, uh, 12 months or 15 months and compared to perhaps uh, the last, you know, five or six years. And I'm wondering, you know, as we go into 2015, what we've learned. So, um, you know, Sean and, and, and Dina, you know, I'll, I'll kick off with you, Sean. What have we seen this year that we think um, may be a trend or something that our, our audience should think about? Well, Joe, <clears throat> you know, you're bringing up the idea that these are coming faster, and I agree. Of course, the Division of Analytics and Surveillance at the FERC is uh, uh, just gaining steam. They're getting better at what they do. And so what we've seen, more and more investigations are coming out. I'm getting more and more calls. The fact of the matter is what we're seeing is that often market participants are astonished because what they see is, look, I abided by the market rules, haven't violated anything, and yet they're uh, accusing me of fraud. And the fact is there's a chasm between following the market tariff and what can be tried as market manipulation under a fraud-based rule. I think the concern is that what we're seeing is that that chasm is growing wider and wider. I think the agency had the perception that we'll put all these settlements out there. People will figure out exactly what it is that we're trying to prosecute. And the reality is that the bar of what can be perceived as fraud is getting moved further and further and further away so that, again, there's this continual astonishment. Why am I getting prosecuted for this? What did I do wrong? People hear about this in the industry, and they're fearful. So I think that instead of moving towards an equilibrium of compliance, what you're seeing instead is a continued I don't know if it's disbelief or it's just misunderstanding of what exactly market manipulation is and what one can do to avoid being accused under these rules. I do think, however, that 
one of the things that we've seen in, in over the course of the recent history of FERC's <coughs> enforcement cases is more of an emphasis on what FERC considers to be the big cases, the again, from their perspective, market manipulation cases. When this first started after the Energy Policy Act of 2005, there seemed to be more of an emphasis on what I would call sort of more run-of-the-mill violations, the shipper must have title cases, the prohibitions against buy-sells, those sorts of things. But in many ways, comparable to what you're saying now, even then, I think practitioners were reading the tea leaves. We were looking at each case and trying to figure out, okay, from that case, what can we glean from it? What were the rules that FERC was particularly interested in? And then how can we go and train our clients to be particularly sensitive to this specific set of facts? And I think we've continued to see that because very few of these cases have gone all the way to the court system. You know, I, I think that's exactly right. And I, I, I reading between the lines, it, it, it's it's almost it wouldn't be too far fetched to say we're probably in no better position in the end of 2014 than you know we were at the end of 2013 or 2012 because of this chasm, and 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 well because of a a, a lack of really precedent setting. Um, uh, cases, whether it's in California with examples like Barclays or, you know, waiting for decisions uh, uh, up in New England for some of the uh, demand response cases. And I think that that's a, um, a very difficult proposition for a lot of the industry to, to digest because they, they're very engaged in these markets. It's a very capital intensive industry. If you are a utility, obviously, you know, you are engaging in the business for purposes of you know, serving load or, or hedging or, or you know selling power into the market, um, if you are trading, I mean trading is obviously what you do. I think for perhaps some of you know your members who are uh, industrial customers, they may not necessarily have the same risk to kind of dive in and, and engage some of these issues. But I, I I I think it would be a very fair analysis to say you, you know the 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 disconnect between what the traditional view of a fraud-based uh, statute may require and what, in fact, the settlements are, are, are telling us or what we're seeing in the market is, is, is very true. I mean, there's, there's a real disconnect. Uh, I think that's right, Joe. When you take a look at a range of these cases, <clears throat> not just FERC's, take a look at the CFTC's cases, too, because they're bringing cases in this area, too, and <clears throat> trace them back, they all trace back into the security statutes. Almost every one of those statutes comes from the fraud sections in the Exchange Act that the SEC administers. And <clears throat> that statute says you're, it, it's not a violation unless you have C enter, really wrongful conduct or really reckless conduct, and if you, unless you have deception in the marketplace. There's a legion of cases that say this. Um, the SEC has administered it that, that way for a long time, although they tend to push the edges, they tend to push out on what C enter, they tend to push out on what constitutes deception, and <clears throat> as people do different things, the the concepts change, and when you, when you look at the CFTC's cases, you look at the FERC cases, you have to say to yourself, where is it? Right. Where's the deception? <clears throat> and that's the issue that's on, uh, <clears throat> that's been briefed in Barclays right now, and it's sitting there waiting for decision, but the defense has said, we don't see the deception. Uh, FERC has said, well, it's there. And then if you look at the complaint, you say, where? And we'll see what the judge has to say about that, but that's a huge problem. And if that line is being overrun by a series of consent decrees, which aren't necessarily law, but they tell you what the agency thinks, that's a real problem if you're a marketplace participant because then you don't know what you can do. But you can certainly understand, I think, why some of these companies would be willing to sign settlements oh, yes. and get get out of the litigation process. I think it, it's very hard as a company to be faced with some very serious charges and to sit there and in the way that the rules operate, to sit there and say, okay, I'm going to just take the FERC penalty and then try to go fight it out in court. And I think there are a lot of companies that for reputational reasons, for resource allocation reasons, as a whole host of business reasons, that they're just simply not willing to fight it through to the court. So we've got far more 
settlements to look at to read the tea leaves than we have pronouncements from the courts. It's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, too, yes. right? right? Until yes. somebody yes. litigates, nobody knows what any of the answers right. are. Nobody wants to be the test case. Right. Well, it's not only that, though. I mean, there's, there's as Dina suggests, there's, there's a huge business component to this for these people. You know, yeah. you, you're looking at potentially years worth of litigation yes. with your employees being tied up in depositions, your, your, your people producing documents, your people are running to court, you're spending a lot of money. Every quarter when, when you have your earnings call, the analysts go, well, what happened to that case? You're, you're getting pounded by the FERC or you're getting pounded by the CFTC. What about that? It just becomes a huge strain. And a lot of times, regardless of the merits, you know, you might look at it and say, I could win this case. There's no deception here. I didn't do anything wrong. But it's a cost of doing business. Right. You pay the fine. You pay the lawyers. You go home. You get to move on. It's done. Next. What else you got to do? Well, I also think sometimes it makes a difference what kind of entity is the target. Yes. Now, when I was in private practice, I represented industrial end users, manufacturing companies. For them, energy and participating in the energy markets is not their core business. And they would always want to know, where's the bright line? Where am I absolutely safe? And if the bright line is here, they want to be even far away from the, from the line. They want to be clearly in the safe zone because it's not worth it to them to be in some gray area. It's not their core business. They're trying to make products to sell. They're not trading gas for the sake of trading gas in the market. Well, when you think about most of these cases, they involve interactions between markets. So an interaction, say, between the physical market and the financial market. So how are, are your clients dealing with the issue of that the FERC is so often, and now the CFTC increasingly is interested in surveilling the interactions across these marketplaces? I think they're struggling. I think they're struggling with how to do that because they really, again, for, for those who that is not their core business, they want to be safe. And I think some transactions, they're just not willing to run the risk. They're just not willing to do those transactions. They're getting out. They're either not doing them or they're finding third parties to manage their energy portfolio so that becomes hopefully somebody else's risk and somebody else's problem. So, so as that happens, there are fewer counterparties to trade with. Right. And, and the liquidity of the market dries up. <clears throat> right. And uh, one of the things that I think is, is becoming well known is the best cure for the markets uh, uh, to prevent market manipulation from ever occurring in the first place is to have robust market participation and liquidity. Right. Okay. No, I, I, absolutely. You know, so you know, when or where or why would you ever fight one of these cases? I mean, is it a matter that if it's your if it's your core business, right, and it's a reputational issue and you, you're not, I mean, of course, we think the lawyers are, are, are well worth it. I mean, it's, it's worth, you know, paying the lawyers or, you know, the, the consultants. You know, why would you ever in, engage in the risk? Um, I it, think some companies just get pushed too far. Yeah, uh, they they've been through the ringer more than once, and there's somebody probably fairly high up in the company who just decides, you know, I'm done. I'm I'm going to fight this, and and hopefully they believe that they've got a good case. I mean, that's sort of the predicate for being willing to fight that they, that they don't have a dog of a case, but they've got a good case, and they're tired of it, and they feel like it's time. It's time to get an answer, and, no. they're, and they're willing to take it all the way. I, I think that's actually exactly right. I mean, it has to be you know, part of your core business. It has to be uh, uh, reputational almost, okay. and you obviously need to have a strong case. But I, I, I think there needs to be a stand, you know, probably by management, that, you know, what they what they did was okay, and, and they're willing to, you know, fight until heck freezes over, and then, and then they'll fight on the ice. And that's really, you know, the only way to, to approach litigation in, in, in general. But I, I think that um, until – you have these things being litigators, there must know and, and some type of precedent that's going to bind both the parties and FERC. You know, there's really more um, business. With it, there's more business sense almost in, in settling the thing. You know, rather than going out and, and really staking a, a claim. Um, you know, we, we were talking about you know Barclays, and uh, not to get too far into that one. But, you know, the, these cases pending in California and, and, and the demand response cases pending in New England are real interesting because, 
you know, one of the things that will come out of them is, you know, what the Novo review really means right. and, you know, what it will mean for a court to, a, a case to actually go to court. Right. And if it means that, um, you know, the, the, the Article Three judge, in a sense, just rubber stamps and applies the highest degree of deference to, you know, FERC's decision or FERC's, uh, you know, reasoning, that's one thing. But if we're talking about a, a, a real trial in front of a jury with, with discovery and depositions, well, that, that can mean an entirely different thing. And that should um, uh, be welcomed, I think, by the industry to the extent that, that you either get resolution and, and you know what you're dealing with, or, uh, oh, excuse me, you get resolution and you know what you're dealing with. And if it's if it's a, a real proceeding, then you go ahead and you, you have that analysis in your in your business tolerance model, and you go and you litigate it if it really matters to you. I agree with that. I mean, I think it would help FERC and the industry to know what de novo review means. That's, I mean, that that seems pretty mm -hmm. basic to me. I thought I knew what de novo review means. I I have to say I'm a little bit surprised that that there's such a fight over what we, I think we all learned in maybe the first year of law school. Yeah. Um, first month, probably. First yeah. month, right, right, exactly. <laughs> but, th but it's a fight, and having that sorted out will help future cases, will help FERC. And there's some, there's some other jurisdictional issues, as in whether FERC has jurisdiction over a person. That's right. In addition to a corporate entity, and what's the definition of entity? And that has not been resolved definitively. So mm -hmm. some of these cases... Having it resolved on the settlement level is not the same as having it resolved at the court level. No, and I think that, that whole question about person and individuals is going to may be determinative because where I think you're going to get more litigated cases is the traders, the individuals. Mm -hmm. If they're getting indemnified by the company and at some DNO policy someplace, then they have the money to fight this. And they don't have the business reason necessarily that the company has to say, I can't put up with this on the earning calls. I can't put up with the drain on my executives. They need to win that case or they're out of the business. Right. So the individuals may be the ones that push these cases up. And they're the ones who may litigate them ultimately, assuming that FERC has jurisdiction over them to start with. Well, and assuming <clears throat> that the individuals have deep enough pockets to continue to pursue the litigation and to defend yeah. themselves. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they, they, they need a DNO policy behind them. Otherwise, right. they're not going to be able to do yeah, it. Yeah, because it's going to be a lot of money. Right. So, so let's say we get to federal district court litigation. I mean, what, 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 what does it take for FERC to win? I mean, what does deception mean based on the, the consent agreements we've seen and, 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 the, and the trade press? You know, what is market manipulation? How, how do you win or lose that case? But that's that's not a, that's not an easy issue. No, the courts no. the courts have struggled with that for a long time, and you get things like the J P Morgan settlement where they say, "Well, we followed the tariff," and they say, "Yeah, well, so what?" We still have deception here someplace. Um, Constellation Energy, you have the same kinds of issues. So you have different kinds of issues in in different cases, but someplace somewhere you have to do something that turns into deception, and usually in a manipulation case. It's an artificial price, which is not an easy concept either. I mean, theoretically, it's supply and demand, which I'm sure Sean can talk about better than I can. But in the cases in cases where you see them say there is deception and where there may well be deception is the between market cases, and you you can make a bunch of money over here if you can push the price up over there. So if you push the price up over there, and you make all this money. Maybe that's an artificial price on the one market, but take a look at it and see what happens. What happens the next day and the day after that, after the day after that? So if I push it to pick a number 50, and then I stop pushing, and it goes the next day, it's like 30, you might have an artificial price there. You probably do. Um, I think at least a lot of people would say that you do. But if you push it up to 50 and it stays there because other people come in, well, then that might not be deception. That might not. That might just be. That's what the market thinks. The market thinks the price is fifty. So even though I made a lot of money, and FERC I think would tell you, or the CFTC would tell you, that's uneconomic trading. If that price stays there, I don't think you've got an artificial price, and I don't think you're seeing deception. Well, you know, it's interesting. You bring up uneconomic <laughs> trading, and of course, most of the first cases that have been brought, and increasingly with the CFTC, we're seeing these cases be brought on the idea of that somebody is doing something intentionally 
uneconomic, mm -hmm. either to a price or in mm -hmm. a volume or to, to affect some process in the marketplace, J.P. Morgan being an example, mm -hmm. that's designed to uh, create some bias that then benefits them through either receiving an out-of-market payment or by benefiting derivatives or what have you. <clears throat> and as you know, I've written quite a bit about this. Depending on whether you have an artificial price statute, which the FERC doesn't have but the CFTC does, right. or a fraud-based statute, which both the FERC and the CFTC as well as the SEC do, the fact is that if somebody is intentionally going into the marketplace not to make money on the transaction at hand, but simply performing that transaction to create the bias, there's a question of intent. That's, that's really the intent behind the fraud-based statute. If somebody is going in intentionally trying to bias some market outcome to benefit some other position, the agencies are going to have a problem with that. The problem is that every purchase tends to raise prices. Every sale tends to lower prices. How do you differentiate intentional uneconomic behavior from, for example, the normal losses that are incurred in business. Mm -hmm. Somebody could have just made a bad choice. That's right. And the fact is, if you think about a winning and losing trade, by definition, somebody loses on every trade, right? Right. <laughs> right. You're not going to invest it, investigate everybody, and I'm not trying to imply that the agencies necessarily do. It's, it's really a question of, do you have all the pieces in place to execute that example that I described, where you have some something to trigger the manipulation, something targeted by the manipulation and then some nexus between the two. Are those pieces in place? And then the second question, which is extremely important, is there intent? Is there the scienter? And that's really where, where these cases fall. How do you prove that somebody was doing something not to make money on a standalone basis, not even on accident, right. but because they were intentionally trying to create that bias? And do you think that you can look at those pieces <clears throat> and sort of reverse engineer to get to intent? Well. I worked at the FERC for two and a half years on these cases, so I, so I do I, I do have I have an opinion. I do think you can, but the way that historically this has been proven is you look for evidence of repeated behavior, the kind of behavior where it's not that somebody just loses money every now and again here and there. There are focused losses that occur with enough repetition to where you say, "Darn, somebody would have noticed that. Somebody should have stopped doing that." usually combined with the, the, the more uh, documentary evidence of the, the scathing emails, the IMs, the voice recordings that say, look at me, I'm executing Death Star, the hammer, or whatever, whatever. Most recently in the SEC context with gravy. Mm -hmm. I think. Yes. <laughs> gravy. <laughs> gravy. Um, so when you have all of that evidence, yes, I think you can prove it. Uh, the, what concerns me with that fraud line getting moved further and further is that there's less and less reliance on the objective documentary evidence and more and more evidence more and more reliance on just the repeated behavior how much repetition is enough right is it twice um, I've, I've had some recent cases where that's been asserted to be true no objective evidence whatsoever well, how's that even a pattern good question yeah so, but, but again, it's, it's those kinds of uh, investigations, whether, whether they ultimately prove out or not, that should make people in the industry worry about the interactions amongst these instruments. And again, the, the way all too many people are reacting is to just simply get out. You either trade in the physical right. instrument, you trade in the financial instrument, you don't trade in both. Do you find that the agencies are becoming more aggressive as time has gone on? Yes. Okay. And then how so? Well, and again, I, I think that initially there was an effort to, to use and combine both of those types of, of evidence mm -hmm. to weave a story. And I think as time has gone on, the feeling is that these settlements that have been issued have some sort of legal effect that allows the bar to be pushed of, well, now, you know, you had mentioned that the SEC yes. presses the intent. Yes. Um, but the fact is the SEC has actual case law. The SEC has actual case law, although you know, when, when you're placing trades, if you're doing the securities market, and every individual trade, there's, there's, there's really nothing wrong with it. So people who get charged in these cases will come in and say, well, you know, I bought 10,000 shares of Apple. Everybody, lots of people do that, so what's wrong with that? I bought, and I did it day after day after day, or I shorted it, or something like that, and they'll say, well, 
where's the manipulation? And it's the same thing in the energy markets. If you're doing what in and of themselves are legitimate transactions, the question is how are you going to net this out to deception in the marketplace? The pattern is one thing. If you're losing money day after day, it's another thing. If you're making money here day after day so that when you net it out, that might get you to pattern. But it's still, it's, it's open market transactions that are lawful in and of themselves. Even in the securities markets, which have been doing these statutes for a lot longer, there's still a big problem drawing where the line is. And the SEC has been moving closer and closer to just intent. You know, and you say, well, where's the deception? And they say, well, you had an intent to deceive. And you say, mm -hmm. fine, but my intent to deceive in my head is not deception in the marketplace. Nobody got deceived by me thinking bad thoughts. So you've got to, you've, I think you've got to get it someplace into the marketplace. And I think that's a problem for all these regulators. No, and, and because we don't have litigated cases that go to a court decision, it sort of gives more weight, it seems, to the, to the settlements, and they almost become precedent, although we all know they're not strictly legal precedent, but in terms of the next case that comes along when you're in the settlement discussions with FERC and the prior cases are out there, you know they're out there, FERC staff knows they're out there, and they do have some weight behind them, I think. I think they have a lot of weight in the charging decision. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, the agency staff is not going to say to you, well, we settled with so-and-so, and this is what we had, although they might. I was going to say. They can't, they can't <laughs> cite them. They shouldn't be, oh, because the answer should be, so what? Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes they do, but they can't cite them in, in papers, right. in court, no, or any no. place like that. They might tell you that. But the staff knows that, as you said, and the staff is thinking about that. And so they say, we got five other guys doing this. We're getting you. Right. And yeah. you get charged. And then the question is, do you want to litigate? And the answer is probably no. Yeah. So now and, they've got six. Right. Right. Well, and then when it gets to the settlement discussion, it's five other guys agreed to this. So we want you yes. to agree to this, yes. whatever this is, in this settlement. And then you become six, and that helps them in, in the next case. That helps them when they go to seven. Right. Exactly. Right. So, so Tom, mm -hmm. just from um, just a, a, a white collar slash. You, you need to do a public service announcement. Oh, okay. Uh, I guess this is for the New York CLE code. Um, the code number is ZKT514. Again, that's ZKT514. Thank you. Um, Tom, back to that idea. Let's just apply a little white collar context and some SEC context here. How do you really distinguish between attempt, right? versus the idea that I want to actually engage in deception, right? Versus actually engage, I mean, we're calling it an open market transaction, but I think what we're referring to just for the audience is just a transaction engaged in on, on ICE or in an RTO where that's publicly reported and, and people see the price, and, well, maybe not <clears throat> the entire price, but they'll see the rates, terms, and conditions of whatever the, the deal is. I mean, how, how do you distinguish from as a prosecutor versus, versus a defense attorney from attempt versus the idea that, yeah, I, I really want to do this, but when it comes down to actually pushing the button, I'm not, I'm not going to. Well, the differentiating actual manipulation from intent is, <clears throat> I think, almost impossible. There's a, there's a relatively recent, actually, I think it's a spinoff of the Hunter case, um, <clears throat> where they, they say, and there's an SEC case out that recently says the same thing, an attempt is just a, a, a failed manipulation, okay? So it's a failed manipulation. But what does that mean? If the statute requires deception and see enter, does that mean I failed to get any deception, which means it's all in my head? Mm -hmm. Which shouldn't be a violation. But if you look at this recent CFTC case, which is, you know, and there are other cases like this, um, it really reduces it down to attempts. So if you have this pattern again, but you failed to get any place. Let's say you failed to really push the price, but you had this sort of motive over here, which is not actually an element. They may well charge you for that. Yeah, kind of like a Keystone's cops attempt to manipulate the market and yeah, falsify exactly. its face. But, yeah, yeah. So th there's no. You just weren't good at. You, you were. You were good. You, you were a bad criminal. You know. You tried. We know you tried. You thought about it and you tried it. Can, can I ask a question? Sure. So, so 
when I think about that from the standpoint of, let's say that you do something every day, mm -hmm. you're successful every other day, but the nexus doesn't bind, say for example, congestion doesn't occur, do you only get charged then for the 15 days that you were actually successful? And by the way, I would differentiate. A successful manipulation creates an artificial price or mm -hmm. creates a, some effect, some bias. An attempt doesn't, right? It doesn't mean yes, you didn't no, try to get there. No, I agree. You, you might have tried, but if you didn't get there, you didn't get there. So how are they going to know that you were trying to do that? Well, you did the same looking behavior every day. So mm -hmm. I sold 10,000 shares of Apple into right. clothes every day. I had the same derivatives or options that were short to the price mm -hmm. every day. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with selling on a standalone basis, selling 10,000 shares of Apple into the close. There's nothing wrong with holding uh, options that are short to the price. Mm -hmm. It's the question of if you're doing one to affect the value of the <clears throat> other that's called banging the close. Yes, and, it, and it's exactly. illegal under SEC law, yes. and the FERC has prosecuted similar cases. So I guess my question is, if I do that every day for a month with the same positions in place, do I get stung only for the 15 days where I was successful, or do I get popped at least with a penalty for all 30 days? Well, and I think that's, that really sort of highlights the problem with this. If nothing's happening in the marketplace, then as a matter of law, it shouldn't be violating the statute. But I think the agencies will tell you that pattern is enough, mm -hmm. and that pattern is enough to say, well, you're just not very good, you know, <laughs> you're really better, but you're not, so I'm only going to give you the attempt. But then you get whacked anyways, and you get fined, and so you still get penalized for doing that. Um, you know, it's if, if you insider trade, take something simpler, but it doesn't work out, they'll still go after you and prosecute you for insider trading, you know. If you get tipped that uh, the earnings release is going to be bad, so you short stock, and, well, guess what, it turns out to be good, they'll still prosecute you even though you lost money. Mm -hmm. um, and they have prosecuted cases like that. Um, you know, if you move to antitrust and you do conscious parallelism, well, I really wanted to become a monopolist, but I just, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know, I didn't quite get across the line. Now what? And you on know? the insider trading cases, is there more of a penalty or do they in some <clears throat> way throw the book at you more if you were actually successful than if you weren't? In some, in some, well, what they can't get is if you were unsuccessful, like my example, mm -hmm. they won't get the disgorgement and all the, all, and all right. the prejudgment interest right. because you lost. Right. But, but other than that. But other than that, they'll, they'll, they'll still impose a big fine on you. Interesting. Same is so, true. Same is true for FERC and CFTC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Do the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll still impose a big fine on you, and if they can figure out how to do something else, they'll do something else along with it, even though you're just a really bad insider trader. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's the reason I was asking is because, you know, when FERC started down this path, they said they were modeling some of their rules and regulations against um, uh, what the SEC had been doing mm -hmm. for years and years, and there's a bigger body of case law, obviously, in the SEC than there is at, at FERC. So I was just curious. As sure. They were. And, and the language of the statutes is all pretty yes. much the same. Yes, so it it's is. all fraud-based kinds of things. Um, so you can really look at that. But the SEC has brought those cases. There's one about a year ago, I think, in um, Northern District of Georgia, where the guy actually did fail, and he actually got indicted on top of it, mm -hmm. which... They don't always bring criminal cases, but he got indicted for that. But he did it over and over and over. He had a couple, spoofing su case he had a couple successful trades. Yeah. The, um, the spoofing case from last month? No, that's Panther. And Panther. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a different case. Yeah. But that's more like the high speed of trading case. That yeah. we so this guy was just repeatedly bad at what yeah. he was trying to this do. This guy was repeatedly bad, and uh, but he also had some good trades. And, you know, the SEC went and got him, and then the criminal prosecutors went and got him. You don't always have to be successful, but differentiating between a failed manipulation and a real manipulation, it's hard enough to find a real manipulation uh, unless it's really just raw. But a well, fail, much harder. So on the, um, the, uh, the uh, point of real manipulation, uh, uh, we've mentioned a couple of cases. Uh, how do we feel about the concept of being able to comply with the letter of the tariff and I guess by implication engage in an open market transaction and then still uh, engage in an uneconomic behavior. Okay. Well, so the tariff allows me to lose money in a physical trade. Um, nothing prevents that. The tariff allows me to hold FTRs that are either long or short to prices at various points. 
But if I lose money in a sale at a particular point, and as a result I suppress congestion to the benefit of an FTR that's sourced at that point, well, that can be viewed as a manipulation. Absolutely, yeah. So all of those transactions, all of those pieces are fully uh, uh, compliant with the tariff, but it's the sum of putting them together that <clears throat> is suggestive of some intent. The problem is that if you get really large traders that are really hedging in organizations where there are multiple traders, the fact is there's interactions all over the place. You can't help it. They're not necessarily intentional. What can be done and what I've seen done is that the uh, investigations will pick the few trees out of the forest that are interacting with one another and say, aha, there's the intent. The reality is, if you take a step back and you look at the two forests and see that, no, really, these all uh, had a legitimate business purpose on a standalone basis. You just happen to be picking out the two trees that are interacting in the way that you think that is suggestive of manipulation. You can show, you, you, can, you can overcome that intent uh, argument. Okay. So from the, uh, leveraging off of that point, how actually do you defend one of these things? So you get a subpoena from FERC or from the CFTC or Department of Justice, and they say, um, provide us all the documents concerning all your trades on December 31st, you know, 2013. Um, what's the what's the first thing you should do practically in terms of putting together your defense? Uh, I think the first thing you need to do is take a look at the trades. Mm -hmm. You've got to get out the trading documents. You've got to talk to the traders. But before, after talking to the traders, you really need to get out the documents. You need to see the positions, and you need to start figuring out mm -hmm. what they're doing in the marketplace. You know, take so. Talk to the trader, get the positions, get the compliance policies. Uh, one of the mm -hmm. things that hung up Constellation Energy was they had a compliance policy that said they shouldn't be doing what they were doing, which is not real, real good. Right. Uh, not real helpful to the defense. <laughs> right. So, you know, you need to look at those three pieces, and then you really need to probably, there's a lot of these things that are probably fairly complicated. You, pro you probably need to get them put up in a computer and really run the model and analyze them. And, and have uh, you know have an economist really take a good hard look at what are you doing to the pricing in the markets? You know you're, you're trading here, you're trading here, and you know, constellations is as good an example as any. What, what, what's happening here every time you buy? Well, Sean's right. Every time you buy, the price goes up, but that's what's supposed to happen. Right. right. So what else is happening? And over here, what are you doing? You know, you're selling, so the price goes down. That's what happens all the time on an individual basis. But what you, you need to analyze those trends in terms of the overall market impact, and then you need to figure out: is there even even if you're pushing the price here and you're losing money over it, maybe there's a legitimate business reason to do this, and I don't mean make money. Everybody's right. trading to make money, but maybe you have a legitimate hedging reason to do this, or um, in, a, in, a, in a different context, maybe you're pushing the price, say, when you're buying securities, but there's a reason for doing that because of the way the markets trade, because of what this overall strategy and business purpose here is, and if you've got that valid business purpose, you've got something to say to the staff. But, you know, but stepping back from your question, Tom mentioned something I think is really important, is that FERC really expects everyone to have a compliance program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, I think when this whole emphasis on enforcement started, there were a lot of market participants that did not have compliance programs. Everybody needs one. And importantly, to your point, people need to abide by it. I think in some ways it's worse on, on the target if you've got a compliance program and the first thing that FERC staff can see is that you didn't even comply with your own compliance program. That, that's not a good way to start this. And then as the next thing you need to do is to tell everybody, and FERC will probably make you do this, but you need to put a hold on your documents. Yeah, that's, that's oh, right. Yeah, that, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. You, you can't. You've got to just preserve everything, good, bad, and otherwise. Yeah, and then, then you've, I think, I think Tom's right. You've got, you've got to dig in there and figure out from your side of it, from the client side of it, whether there's really something there, there, or whether there is something that, from perhaps an outsider's perspective, appears to be a problem. I mean, I've seen things in client files that are as simple as column headings on an Excel spreadsheet that 
appear to be something really bad. Mm -hmm. Right. And it was just somebody who wasn't thinking from a FERC compliance perspective that labeled these columns in something that was convenient for them that made it sound like something bad was happening when there really wasn't. No, that, that, that's right. And the other benefit of a compliance program is that if, if 90% or 99% of your trading force com complies with it and you have the rogue trader out there, well, then that's right. – that's that's your way to I would say marginalize, but separate yourself from you know whatever behavior uh, that is. So so then we have a a lack of governing for present. We we have these consent agreements. We have these questions about you know what uh, may or may not uh, be enough to trigger a market manipulation claim. Uh, in light of all this ambiguity, how do you put together a compliance program? <laughs> Very careful. I think it's hard. I yeah. think it's hard. I mean, I think that there's some things that are very clear, and it's the it's the non market manipulation pieces of this that are much more clear than they used to be. You know, the, and it's back to the shipper must have title and the prohibition against buy sells and, and those, those sorts of things. Although I have to say that down in the weeds of a transaction, sometimes it's even hard to give advice on some of those fairly simple kinds yes. of rules and regulations. And, and then when you get to to market manipulation, it, it's harder. And I think it, people just have to be sensitized to the cases that FERC has settled, and we're in the settlement realm right now, and what FERC looked at, and it's the cross-market cross, cross market, um, transactions that seem to be the key. And the question is, why were you doing these things? Yes. Yeah. And what, what is the legitimate business reason right. for doing something here that s seemingly from the outside had an impact here? You know, I, I don't know how many companies that I've talked to say, oh, we, we have a great compliance program. We have this risk management guy. He looks right. at our end of days at P&Ls, and he, he says everything's okay. And we have this compliance guy, and he has training, you know, twice a year. And we tell trainers. Online, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 yeah. Right, right. don't do this. <laughs> yeah. You know. Um, and, and the fact is, increasingly, that's that's just not going to cut it. Mm -hmm. And so, but but there's a cost issue. There is a cost issue. And so, for people that are not doing this uh, and heavily into this constantly, it may be the issue that it's just simpler to have some sort of minimal compliance training and to just simply avoid doing certain trades that might be uh, problematic. The people that are more involved in this are actually starting to invest in internal surveillance mm -hmm. and to actually track their own trading and to look at how the instruments within their portfolios interact. Um, and some of the folks I've, I've been working with have actually gone to the, the uh, effort of trying to get their compliance trading program to interact with their actual trading interface so that they can just physically block certain trades. Yes. Yes. from happening. Oh, that's interesting. But that's yeah. very expensive. Those are not off-the-shelf <laughs> programs. No, you have to do it yourself. And yes. You have to do it with, and it's a tailored thing. You bring in people right. to help you with it. But, but that said, the benefit of that is that you can continue to trade more than you would otherwise yes. because that line can be more snug uh, and you can be more comfortable. That said, assuming the FERC keeps the line in the same place. I do think, though, that on the positive side of this, that FERC is cognizant of the fact that they expect bigger companies to spend more and to do more. I don't think FERC has looked at compliance as a one-size-fits-all, because that was something that was of real concern to me in private practice when I represented the manufacturing companies, because they had some FERC conferences that some of the really big traders came in and talked about how much money they'd spent and they had a full-time compliance officer who didn't sit on the trading floor. Well, for an industrial end user, the trading floor is one person yeah. or maybe one and a half or two people. And there's no trading floor. Yeah. There's a, a couple of offices and a couple of computers. And to have a full-time compliance officer just doesn't make any sense. So I do think there's, there's some scalability on this that FERC recognizes. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> something you said too, Sean. One, one of the things we've been sitting here talking about Center and deception right. and all these kinds of interests. And those are all nice legal arguments. And they're terrific if you get charged and, you know, you can make them and maybe you win. 
Um, in, in some instances, you probably should win. But when you're doing compliance, you should put those down. You know, you right. don't want to build a compliance system based on legal defenses in court because you're pushing it right to the edge. Unless you have a tolerance for risk that's really way up there. That's you right. want to really be more conservative. So take a look at, okay, this is what they're doing. This is the way they're charging this stuff. Get inside the lines. Unless you want to spend the kind of money that Sean's talking about to do these individualized things where you can take more risk, if you don't want to do that or you can't afford it or whichever it is, get yourself back inside the lines of what's acceptable behavior and monitor that and teach your people this is what's acceptable and we don't want you outside these lines. You minimize your risk, you minimize your expense. You know, if you want to spend more money, build a system like Sean's talking about. I've also heard some people recently talk about that they believe it would be helpful if FERC had an Office of Compliance. Yeah. You know, in addition to an office of enforcement, that people that you could go to, and I know that you can go and get informal advice. I understand how the current system operates, but I think the people I've heard talk about this want it more robust than what is there now, that somebody can really go in and say, this is what I'm doing or this is what I want to do, and get an answer that they can really take back to their companies. A binding answer. A binding answer yeah. that they can take back to their companies and say, I checked with FERC. This is what we're doing, and this is fine. Almost like a petition for declaratory order in a you know, smaller <clears throat> context. Right. It's focused on compliance and enforcement issues. Right, something you can do much more streamlined than a petition than a petition for declaratory order. But some of the some of the kinds of things that I have heard about, people want a faster answer than that. Yeah. No, I, 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 absolutely. Um, any thoughts? No, is he, I think that's an interesting idea, yeah. but I don't know if it's practical. But, <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I don't think they'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> that's you a know, different yeah. issue. Right? Yeah. SEC enforcement would never talk to you about that stuff. You know, you, you could get like a no action letter out of the Division of Corporation right. Finance on a corporate transaction. Right. You can go to like DOJ and on an FCPA transaction. You might be able to get them to give you essentially a no action letter. Although the last one I saw come out took nine months to come out. Uh, so you're not getting anything anytime soon. Right. Um, That's a long time. Yeah, it is a long time. And, you know, if you're sitting there waiting to do a transaction, right. That's a real long time. So how practical that would be and how binding the advice would be, um, I don't think the government's going to give people the answer. I think when you're doing these compliance programs, you're either going to wind up with Sean's talking about with, you know, a fairly sophisticated program or you're going to wind up with something a lot simpler, but it's got to be way in the middle. I mean, way away from the edge. Yeah, right. and, and then with the, the middle approach, I mean, the issue is what do you do to capture that last 10 percent of compliance, right? The the, the 1 percent deal that, that flies out of out of, uh, out of a field, I guess. You, you know, well, to, no, no, I, was, no, I was going to say, the, the thing about this that's frustrating is that the agency wants compliance. The industry wants to be compliant. Yeah. Yes. And so everybody agrees on the solution, and yet what are we getting? Well, we're getting these settlements, and I often hear them referred to as I know it when I see it, example-driven enforcement, that ultimately are supposed to, over time, give us enough guidance to be able to shepherd us into this, this uh, uh, compliant uh, behavior. The problem is if that line keeps shifting, and if what we're going to continue to do is get more and more examples that are further and further afield, how is anybody going to really ever know fully how to be compliant other than to simply avoid doing the behavior altogether? Well, and I think for some, some companies, that's what they do. You know, if they get the advice that the line is here, they're going to stay really far away from that line mm -hmm. because it's, they're too risk averse. It's not their core business. They just don't want to go there. And is that good for the market? No, I mean, again, the one thing that prevents manipulation from occurring, especially uneconomic trading from having impact on the market, is liquidity. Mm -hmm. If I traded those 10,000 shares of, of Apple at the close and there's only 20,000 shares being traded, I'm going to have a pretty strong effect on price. If I trade those shares and there's a billion shares being traded, it's going to be a drop in the ocean. The fact is, as the liquidity dries up, the price magnification of these effects becomes much greater, and as a result, manipulation becomes more of a threat. Yeah. yeah you know, so applying these concepts um, – 
in instances where you can't get out of the market, let's say, for example, you are a utility, and this is coming up uh, quite frequently, particularly in the upper Midwest, you are a utility and you have an uh, environmental compliance issue. And for whatever reason, um, you need to shut down your plant. But the market in which you are operating has certain mandatory uh, obligations where you need to offer all that capacity into the market during certain time periods. You know, what happens if you, you can't back out? You, you, you have a, 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 um, a, uh, a conflict between, you know, one agency telling you to do one thing, like pull off your plant, or, you know, the, a, a tariff, and this issue has come up in, in the middle of the, you know, the country. Is something like that market manipulation? I mean, can you be accused of uh, physical or economic withholding by virtue of compliance of uh, an environmental regulation, um, which could force you into noncompliance with the FERC tariff? I, I would suggest that if you have a legitimate business purpose for why, what you mm -hmm. are doing, that your intent is in furtherance of that purpose and is not sufficient to be counted as fraud. Yeah. And, and that's, that's been the position that I've, I've held pretty firmly to. Um, the question, for example, though, let's say I have a fleet of generators right. and I'm altering how I bid them into the marketplace because they have different, uh, uh, let's say, different permitting requirements. The fact that I change the way that I bid them into the market is designed for one purpose, but oh yeah, it also has this other purpose that allows me to make money on, say, uplift payments or something else. That's more of a concern, especially if you get the documents that say, boy, we can right. really get a whole lot of uplift payments <clears throat> if we do this. Right. Take your time getting the thing back online or whatever. Or mm -hmm. Don't don't correct that, that misstatement because of the, well, California or, you know, New England, wherever the, the uplift payment, yeah. Right. And, yeah. And, and so that's just some, uh, it, it's a good warning to people that, you know, it's not if you have one legitimate purpose and 10 illegitimate purposes that the FERC is going to say, oh, well, you had the one legitimate purpose, that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the behavior has to be performed for a standalone legitimate business purpose as you try to buy us something else that's a concern. Yeah, no, I, I agree with Sean, but that's, that's a problem because there could be. Other other consequences, yep. and so you document this out. And you say, "Well, I have this, okay. you know, I have this reason, and then there's these rigs, and I talk to the EPA, and all that sort of stuff, and it looks really good, you know." And then they send a subpoena, and you produce the emails, and there's your trader saying, "Wow, we're making a bucket of money over there. This yeah. is really cool." <laughs> yeah. You know, and there goes that. No, that's exactly right. <laughs> right. You, you know, this this darn you know Matt's compliance issue just resulted in us making you know whatever and up with payments or whatever market charge may be out there. Yeah. Um, I think actually we're going to see a lot of these issues. Um, you know, uh, Dina was talking about a lot of her members and a lot of her past experience dealing uh, dealing with uh, end use customers or industrial entities, not wanting to get into too much of a risk, or not not wanting to assume too much risk because this isn't really their their core um, their, their 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 core business model. But, you know, what does the ambiguity mean for, you know, the, the utilities? I mean, do they now impose greater costs on their, their you know, their retail rate payers because they are afraid to hedge, right? Or, you know, to Sean's liquidity model, I mean, do, do the trading shops around the country st uh, stop, you know, engaging in virtuals because of a, a risk of perhaps being uh, drawn into what could be potentially a, a, a viable uh, market manipulation claim. Um, you know what? What? What really is the benefit to you know to the industry to having a very aggressive, potentially ambiguous set of rules? Well, I don't. I don't think there's any benefit to the industry to have, yeah. having vague rules. The reason the regulators like to do it is because they're always afraid that if they draw the line here, somebody will figure out how to go. Like right. that, right yeah. around it. And so they don't want to draw the line. They want to keep fraud as being this incredibly elastic uh, concept that they can sort of drop on whatever they think is fraud. But that creates the problem that Sean's talking about. You lose liquidity, which makes it, which creates more fraud, or at least more potential for fraud. And, and that, that becomes a huge problem. Um, well, I think the market participants want clear rules. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, here's the rule. 
And sometimes they look clear on paper, and then when you try to apply them, they're not clear. But I think ultimately that's what the, that's what market participants want. Market participants want to comply with the FERC rules and regulations, and in order to do that, those rules have to be crystal clear, and there has to be a transparent, very transparent process at FERC. You know, I, I think there, there, when somebody has been a regulator, and people will come in to defend themselves, and frankly, they will lie. And right. it's not yeah. fun being lied to. After being lied to a lot, one begins to assume that everybody is lying. And so, <laughs> you know, f from that standpoint, I see the whole point of the idea that, you know, oh, well, if I set the line here, people are just going to figure out ways to jump over it and mm -hmm. go around it and whatever else. I think your, your point is extremely accurate, which is, I want to know where the line is. I don't necessarily even want to get close to the line, but right now I'm so far away from the line that I'm damaging my business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the fact is, let me know where the line is. I, I don't want to get that close, but I'm going to get a lot closer than I am now. I'll be able to effectively hedge. I'll be able to effectively transact. And I'll get some of the benefits that these com uh, allegedly competitive markets are designed to give me. If not, we're just robbing uh, the markets of efficiency, and we're robbing our, our market participants of, of uh, opportunity. And I think some of these questions are going to have to be resolved in the courts. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think that that will be a benefit for the market participants and FERC and everybody. Okay. No, I, I think that's exactly right. And, and I think everybody will benefit by something being decided by an entity other than FERC, you know, hopefully an Article Three judge that – you know, puts that line down and then, you know, gives the industry participants something to, to keep in mind as they design their litigation positions and their compliance programs and actually binds FERC, you know. Um, so with that, uh, I think that I'm going to turn back to where we began. It's, it's November 4th, 2014. You know, what what, in fact, have we learned in the last eight years, not just in the last you know, 12 or 14 months? Could it be that we, we in fact, need a, 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 a court to decide Barclays, you know, one way or the other, or these demand response cases up in New England? Uh, could it be that, um, you know, we start coming up with a industry, industry initiative to talk about a, a, a compliance group at FERC where we can go in and, and, and seek you know, queer and binding guidance? Um, is it that uh, we need to uh, advise our clients that, you know, part of the, one of the things I mentioned, you know, first and foremost was, you know, don't be afraid of this stuff. It is uh, inherently ambiguous. You need to apply your judgment. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it's just part of uh, doing business in the energy sector here in the U.S. So, and Europe, and Europe. So with that, uh, thank you very much for all of your time, and you know, thank you to the audience for listening in. Thank you. Are we done? Okay. <clears throat> this, this concludes the, uh, the Dorsey Federal Enforcement Forum for today. Uh, I hope all of you have uh, enjoyed the presentations. We've had three panels, one starting with the SEC, uh, one covering uh, some EPA issues, and this last one covering some CFTC and FERC issues. Um, our intention is to try to give you an idea of what the trends are in these areas and to put you ahead of the trend so that you can comply today and not have to get a subpoena tomorrow. In the future, we're planning on repeating the forum, but we're going to rotate different issues with different agencies and in an effort to uh, give all of our clients and the, friends of the and friends of the firm more insight into exactly what's going on with these federal regulatory agencies, which pretty much every business in the country is running into at one point or another. So we hope you've enjoyed it. We thank you for participating, and uh, have a good day.